thanks for having me here. I will try and cover my artistic research of nearly 10 years in 15 minutes, so I do my best. Uh, I am uh, an artist. I've been working with scientists, uh, radio astronomers, and the neuroscientists for the past 10 years. And I will be speaking about uh, this project called Cogito in Space, Space, which I think is uh, especially relevant for our discussion about uh, search for extraterrestrial intelligence. Uh, over uh, this 10 years period, I've been learning a lot about, a great deal about the technology that I use, the radio technologies uh, such as moon bounds and radio transmissions. I became a radio operator myself. I also became a radio telescope operator. And here I am at the Dwingelo Radio Telescope in the Netherlands, which has been my studio for the past uh, 10 years. It's a 25 meter dish, so quite a small one compared to this one in the green back. Um, the first project I developed at the Dwingelo Radio Telescope is called Optics, and it uses a technology that I've heard already been mentioned uh, during this weekend called Moon Bounce. Uh, I use the technology in a visual uh, way, so I nickname the technology Visual Moon Bounce, and essentially I, um, I organize live events, live performances during which uh, the audience sends images that we send to the moon and back in real time as, as part of uh, a performance that we stream on the web and that can be viewed from all around the world. And the performance is uh, very well uh, received every time. Stu, who left his photo on the moon in uh, uh, 1972, uh, and asked him for a copy of the photo. So he kindly sent it to me and I reflected off the surface of the moon and that's the result you see on the, on the right hand side. So working alongside radio astronomers, I started uh, really reflecting upon the cultural value of images that we receive um, from space probes. And uh, I've been really uh, spending a lot, a lot of time thinking about it, the, how these this radio transmissions are really changing our uh, culture, especially our, our visual culture. And there was an article in The Guardian about this uh, some time ago, and uh, the author, Jonathan Jones, uh, describes how uh, images from the Hubble Space Telescope are becoming more relevant than any other visual art ever made in the last century. And I found that really interesting. And for me, this image was especially uh, striking. Uh, this is a photo of the first hole drilled on the surface on Mars in uh, 2012. When I saw this photo, I thought uh, about several things. First of all, to me, it's a form of land art. Uh, so it's uh, the extension of human craft onto another uh, planet uh, using probes, so remote, um, 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 remote mechanism. And also, it made me really reflect upon the realistic quality of this image. So we are uh, receiving images that are becoming increasingly, increasingly detailed and this creates, in my opinion, what I call the dualism of a contemporary cosmology, meaning that uh, we uh, are um, exposed to these extremely uh, detailed photos of uh, celestial bodies that we might never be able to uh, experience directly in our lifetime. And uh, on the other hand, we need to remind ourselves that uh, we can only experience this uh, landscapes uh, remotely uh, with our mind, just with our intellectual experience. And this is uh, somehow built the, the background of the, the, the fabric, let's say, of the project uh, called Cogito, uh, in which I send brain activity into space while the participants uh, view a video of the Earth uh, seen from space. The title, of course, is based on uh, Cartesian philosophy, but also um, it is reflecting uh, about the multiplicity of uh, human experience, of the multiplicity of meaning, of human thought, of human memories, of uh, reality in general. So I wanted to stress the, the duality of any experience that, uh, as humans, uh, we, uh, we live throughout our life. Eventually, the title became Cogito in Space, 
because I wanted to suggest the expansion of the concept cogito as conceived in an era where notions of human form and movement were guided by anthropocentrism and framed within the Euclidean space into the contemporary understanding of relativity and cosmological phenomena. Contemporary physics challenged the anthropocentric view and asserted that space and time are not absolutes that extend equally throughout the universe. The virtual cosmonaut in Cogito in Space starts her journey within the Cartesian mind, localized in the brain and accurately measured through electrical signals, reaching for interstellar space where spatial temporal references blur and eventually fade into the unknown like the radio signals carrying the thoughts. The project is an international collaboration, and this is a list of uh, the main uh, collaborators, uh, three neuroscientists, a radio operator from the CAMERAS organization, which uh, manages the Dwingelo radio telescope, and filmmaker Sandro Bocci, who has uh, collaborated with me in the making of the virtual reality film, as well as the documentary of the project that we have just completed. The idea of sending brainwaves into space was already, has been already explored by Carl Sagan, who uh, included a one-minute recording of brain activity in the Golden Records. And this was the brain activity recording from 1977, done with the old-fashioned needle on paper. And uh, um, back then, the EEG recording, electroencephalogram recording, was uh, quite primitive still and uh, was, was mainly recording the noise caused by facial muscle. And now EEG recording is much more sophisticated to the point that it can detect quite accurately the mind state of the participant to the point that it can cause some privacy issues uh, and it can be used potentially as a signature for uh, each individual. Also, science fiction has been uh, fascinated by the idea of communicating into space uh, through our brain scan, uh, like the science fiction novel Solaris by Polish author Stanislav Lem, who uh, explores the, the topic of uh, human communication and interspecies communication. And also the homonymous movie Solaris by Andrei Tarkovsky, who takes the novel into a more psychological realm and uh, turning the emphasis on the psychological conflict of, of the cosmonaut who loses his identity and sense of belonging while struggling to let go of his memories of his past life on Earth. The film becomes a journey into the hardest search of the human self, ultimately highlighting the difficult, if not impossible, path to self-knowledge and human communication. Salman Rushdie calls Solaris an exploration of the unreliability of reality and the power of the human unconscious, a great examination of the limits of rationalism. And this is how Tarkovsky visualizes the surface of the planet Solaris, essentially a global ocean of waves and currents that cannot be constrained, it's just like a human unconscious and the human thinking process. And another element that uh, was uh, weaved into this fabric that uh, led me to develop the project uh, is also um, philosophy of mind from uh, Thomas Nagel, especially his uh, book, Mind and Cosmos, uh, which I found especially interesting because it explores the limitations of a human, the human mind and um, yet the necessity of a human mind to explore what is larger than itself. So I found this paradox extremely compelling and I wanted to explore it further in the project and also I had uh, I've been uh, throughout the project I've been uh, having some informal conversation with Frank White about the overview effect and how experiencing directly the sight of the earth from uh, outer space has been uh, reported to change the cognitive um, understanding of the planet uh, by the astronauts and cosmonauts who experienced it. So the project exists uh, in two forms, uh, a mobile form, so I take it to festivals and uh, art exhibitions around the world, and also people are welcome to uh, come to the Dwingler radio telescope or any other radio telescope uh, wishing to host it. And uh, the participant enters the cabin, 
And here uh, it's uh, actually a series of photos from the work in progress where we um, had to develop a system to convert the uh, electrical signals produced by the 32 channels uh, into a mono sound that could be sent into space in the real time. And here you see one of the neuroscientists injecting some conductive gel into the socket of the electrodes. Uh, together with this, we had also to develop a way to combine uh, the EEG lab grade device with uh, virtual reality, which took us about two years research. And additionally, uh, finding a way to transmit that in real time in such a way that we uh, wouldn't lose um, any data. And especially, we wanted to um, uh, keep um, uh, the uh, spatial temporal uh, description of the brain. So we wanted, if there was another uh, listener somewhere in interstellar space, uh, we want to keep uh, the, the integrity of, of the signal as much as possible. So one of the challenges of the project was the real-time conversion of 32 channels <coughs> into a mono 44.1 kilohertz audio signal for radio transmission, including the 3D electrode positions that would allow the reconstruction of the cortical activity and topography by a hypothetical receiver. And here I have a, a very long technical description that I'm afraid I don't think I have time to read through. Uh, I'll be happy to give you a presentation if you wish. Uh, the reason why I think this is interesting for SETI is because I think that uh, on the receiving end, uh, this could be also a kind of research that could be used by SETI researchers uh, in, for the de detection of uh, neural signals. And uh, here is a visualization of how we try to uh, um, convert the signals into a normal sound. And, um, okay, so that's more like the technical part. In order to um, make sure that the signal will retain these qualities, we also, we moon bounced my own brain activity. And after uh, moon bouncing it, we found that uh, the signal could still be uh, read and retrieved pretty accurately, so that was a good result. And uh, the only thing that we won't be able to uh, explain to a potential listener is whether we are humans or other mammals, because we share a great deal of similarities in our brain with other uh, advanced mammals. And uh, the work, uh, as I said, took uh, almost two years. Uh, we spent uh, quite a great deal of time uh, as a team at the facilities uh, nearby the radio telescope. So that really allowed us to work together as a, as a team, not only as collaborators, but also as friends. And this really uh, contributed to the uh, success, I think, of the project. And these are some of the images from the virtual reality film that uh, are um, taking the viewer from the uh, birth of the cosmos, uh, from the Big Bang to the formation of planetary system, and so on. So it's quite abstract. And eventually, at some point, towards the end of the film, there is the image of the curvature of the Earth. Uh, well, <coughs> presumably the Earth. There is nothing really that says this is our planet. Uh, it's just, uh, I think, an assumption that everybody seems to make. And at this point, everybody reports a sudden change of the brain activity recording, which is very interesting. Um, and the, 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 the film ends with the image of the blue marble somehow fading away into the back of the retina, uh, as to suggest that we only know our planet through images and videos. We have no direct experience of our planet, and therefore we have a very subjective, very, uh, I think, um, intimate uh, perception of, of the planet we inhabit. I will skip through the slides. Also, there is a video on the website that uh, I will uh, mention in a minute. Uh, you are welcome to see all the documentation of the performances that we ho we hosted so far. And this is the waterfall of the brain activity of one of the participants. And as you see, there are moments in which the brain activity um, um, has a sudden, sudden change in the recording, and uh, the moment when the Earth appears is one of these uh, moments. And now the project has been developed into a documentary that I unfortunately don't have time to talk about now. Um, <coughs> the website is cogitoinspace.org uh, if you want to learn more about it.
Thank you so much. Questions for our speaker? Did I understand you correctly? You sent EEG waves of your brain in space. Yes. And can, pe can people read these? Sure. Yeah, well, uh, we use a, a lab grade device, so quite an advanced. Uh, no, I mean, but I showed these to a doctor, and he would say what? Sorry, I may be done. Well, usually, usually the patients in hospitals have EEG, and the doctor reads them and says, okay, your brain's okay or it's not okay. So I'm wondering, what, <laughs> is there anything special about your brain? Are you thinking about a particular thing, or were you dreaming, or were you like REM sleep? Or? Right. Uh, well, yes, the, the brain activity we record is a spontaneous cognition from the people who view this video in virtual reality. So I was interested when the neuroscientists uh, asked me, uh, which part of the brain would you like to record uh, and send into space? Because usually in the lab, they focus only on one part of the brain, uh, the visual part, the motory part, and so on. So what I wanted to do as an artist was to look at the entire brain at once and record the uh, river of consciousness of the uh, person viewing this video, which lasts uh, 10 minutes. So each uh, brain activity recording is 10 minutes. And it's just spontaneous cognition, so it's very subjective from individual to individual. But you said there is a constancy that when people see the, the limb of this planet, can you say more about, is there a particular region of the brain that lights up, or...? Yeah, well, um, it's not so much about one particular uh, part of the brain that lights up. Uh, it's the entire mind state that has a sudden change. So uh, I'm, I, I'm sure the neuroscientists will be able to tell you exactly each, uh, how each brain activity recording uh, can be interpreted. But usually there is a dominance of alpha waves throughout the entire video which is a usual state of relaxation and so on. And uh, the moment in which the curvature of the planet appears seems to be a moment when people are much more engaged. So as if all of a sudden, after all these abstract images, they see something familiar and uh, something that really grabs your attention or your emotional attachment. Uh, and I experience it also. And um, I, I have to say it, it is really an image that captures somehow very intuitively, very emotionally, uh, the, um, the attention of the viewer for some reason. And I, I, I don't know why. I mean, I would like to also explore the psychological reason behind it. Because as I said, there is nothing that says, OK, this is the Earth. It's just the curvature of a planet in each room. All the questions here? Yeah. You know oh, go ahead. <laughs> I was just going to ask, you said it's only visual, it's not auditory. Um, just curious because sound can have quite a different impact on, on the brain if you're sending signals. Just yeah. No, thanks for the question because I didn't mention the sound. The, uh, initially, the, the video was supposed to be completely silent uh, because I wanted to recreate as uh, faithfully as, as possible the experience of being in outer space and I loved it. I loved silence. I think it's a, a great acoustic tool for arts in general. Uh, but eventually I used a soundtrack from Brian Eno called uh, Stars, I don't remember the full title now, which is a, a rather uh, abstract, very neutral um, soundscape that doesn't lead the viewer into any direction, but rather I think emphasizes this a uh, sense of uh, exploration, of abstract exploration <coughs> of the images. So, Jay's question will switch speakers. Yeah, I'm just going to say that's a very profound thing because the uh, 100 years ago, uh, people would probably not have any response whatsoever to that image. That is true, and this is why I've been uh, uh, thinking so much about the fact that uh, we know the planet only through photos, so it's like knowing a person only through a photo and then you meet the person and it's a completely different experience. And I, I really feel like, okay, we, we inhabit this home and we only know this home from these images and uh, each of us has a very, I think, um, personal, very subjective memory of, of, this, of this house, this home that we inhabit. So, and that, I think, has some profound um, influence on how we experience life uh, on this planet. 
All right, let's thank our speaker again. All right, our next talk is going to be given by Michael Oman Reagan, uh, who is going to be discussing um, the astrobiology and the cultures of science. Hi everyone. Um, if you can't hear me at any point, I might be speaking too softly. Just say louder, and I'll get louder. Um, I want to thank the organizing committees, the hosts, uh, session organizers, and funders of the workshop. Um, I'm an anthropologist, and I work on space science and exploration. And today I'm going to talk about encountering life and expanding the way we think about that encounter beyond mankind, beyond humankind to all kinds. So what I'm proposing today is a moonshot. It requires major technical and intellectual advances, but it can start today uh, with a relatively simple shift in perspective. As Barry Blumberg wrote, astrobiology raises fundamental questions not only in biology, physics, and chemistry, but also in philosophy, psychology, religion, theology, and the way in which humans interact with their environment and each other. It's this last point that I'm going to focus on, how we choose to interact with what and who we encounter. The history of science and technology teaches us that when we seek something, we should be prepared to find it, and that we'll benefit from building that preparation into how the science is done. Not only planning for reactions after the discovery, which is very important, but also incorporating the possibility of success into the methods. If we think about astrobiology as a science of contact in that way, what methods should we use for that encounter? Consider the story of a mysterious purple orb that was discovered in the deep sea. In 2016, scientists on the exploration vessel Nautilus were searching the deep ocean with Hercules a remotely operated vehicle, when they found something unexpected. A mysterious purple orb that appeared to be a previously undocumented object or life form, they didn't know what it was. So the researchers on the Nautilus used the robot to vacuum up the orb, took it from its environment and brought it to the surface. Here it is in situ and then on board the ship. So we might ask, <coughs> Is this actually the most effective way to study something unknown? And also, is this, how we, is this how we want to interact with something for the first time? On the one hand, it's standard scientific practice to take a sample. On the other hand, just moments after the first encounter, this life form was removed from its environment, and in the process, it was killed. In many of our encounters with life so far, as Catherine demonstrated in her talk very well, we've often focused on extracting and consuming, trying to get information or energy from everything we encounter. Often this also includes members of our own species. In an essay on colonialism and space exploration from an indigenous perspective, Lou Cornum writes, not all encounters with the other must end in conquest, genocide or violence. We do not travel to the distant reaches of space in order to plant our flags or act under the assumption that every planet in our sights is a terra nullius, nobody's land, waiting for the first human footprint to mark its surface. Astrobiology is especially well suited to be at the forefront of developing and adopting different methods of contact for all sciences, for all our interactions with life on Earth today and for future encounters with life elsewhere as we know it and life otherwise as we don't yet know it. <coughs> Anthropocentrism and the assumption of human superiority are not scientific principles in astrobiology. They're something we often work against. But if we're going to assume humans and maybe a few other species on Earth are superior or more deserving of moral consideration than others, then at the very least, that should be an explicit part of the science not a black box shaping the ideas and methods about contact. But I think astrobiology can take a leading role in changing how we think about contact. By doing so, lead a shift in how we approach building a future with science and technology, but without the historical violence often embedded in the science and technology of exploration. 
At the SETI Institute's Decoding Alien Intelligence Workshop, I suggested a radical first contact approach for astrobiology and SETI. The idea here is to push the limits of both our astrobiological and anthropological imagination beyond the traditional scope of what and who deserves moral consideration and what and who could be anthropological subjects or is considered a person and beyond our ideas about what might be a potential partner for communication. <laughs> so radical first contact means approaching any encounter with life as though it is also a potential intelligence, culture, or agent inviting communicative contact and moral consideration. So when we encounter any sort of biotech, nature, culture, eco, structure, system, pattern, or form of doing, being, living, in any recognizable or unrecognizable form, in a terrestrial or extraterrestrial space, radical first contact means approaching it with compassionate caution, care, respect, moral consideration, and openness to the possibility of contact, communicative or otherwise. If we think about contact in this way, every search for life and every potential discovery is also a search for intelligence, possible first contact. Recently, many have made the important point that SETI is part of astrobiology. But to prepare astrobiology for success, I think we also have to approach astrobiology as a potential form of SETI. Watching that Nautilus video of the encounter with the purple orb, I was struck by the way basic scientific methods can be experienced by the subject as indifference and as violence. This is not news to many humans and most other life on Earth. That could have been a first encounter with life as we don't know it, or with intelligence as we haven't imagined it. So how do we become a species that approaches these encounters with care, caution, and respect for possibilities? One way to think about this issue is through our motivation for the search. Why are we searching? And who are we conducting the search on behalf of? Consider the Apollo 11 lunar plaque, which says, we came in peace for all mankind. This idea persists in exploration, reappearing in documentaries, speeches, science fiction. So that historical moment of the space race and the idea of exploration for all mankind sometimes takes up otherwise empty ethical space around our motives for exploration. But what happens if we expand who we're searching on behalf of? From for all mankind to all humankind, to all earth life, to all possible life, for all kind. What would change in astrobiology if we were doing it not just for us, but for the very thing we are seeking for life itself? If we seek answers about life on behalf of life, it would make sense to prioritize methods of contact that avoid causing harm. Consider the concept of ahimsa, or non-harm. The idea that to harm other beings is to harm yourself. It's a principle from Hindu, Jain, and Buddhist philosophy. Think of ahimsa as a sort of technology of interaction. It was invented thousands of years ago. What would exploration and discovery look like if we approached our methods through the idea of non-harm? Here on Earth, we're not the longest lived residents, not the oldest, not the largest, not the most numerous, and depending on how we define it, not the smartest. <laughs> if we expand our thinking from mankind to all kind, we introduce the possibility of more collaborative encounters with life instead of competitive ones, peaceful, mutually beneficial contact instead of extractive discovery. And we might consider Earth and life in new ways. After all, we've barely begun to understand and appreciate all of the life here on Earth. Not just the biology and intelligence, but the technology, engineering, architecture, and cultures of non-human life <coughs> here on our own planet. And as some have suggested, alien life could be here in a shadow biosphere we have yet to recognize or might not understand as life. Even a non-human intelligence we can communicate with. We might already know them. I've talked about three methods we could use to start changing how we think about discovery and contact. To sum these up, considering all contact a potential contact with intelligence. Expanding the reason for the search beyond mankind to all kind. And leading in science and exploration by adopting an approach of non-harm. <coughs> Some practical applications of these methods could include 
working to observe and learn first, rather than extract, remove, or kill. Martine mentioned a wonderful example of this on Saturday, computationally modeling entire biological systems, developing the ability to test hundreds of drugs a day, which could lead to the end of animal testing. Innovations like that are not only better for life, but faster and more effective for science. We just haven't always prioritized that kind of innovation. Another practical application is to include efforts in astrobiology to transform humanity so that we're ready to encounter life elsewhere or otherwise. Part of this means becoming a species that cares for and protects all life on Earth now, human and non-human. A species that puts life above profit, nations, borders, expediency, above the idea of possessing land and goods, and above historical methods of discovery that involve destruction or disregard for lives and cultures. A third way to apply these methods is to redefine what it means to be a successful astrobiologist, to include applying principles of non-harm, caretaking. Success in astrobiology should mean protecting ecosystems, defending the cultures and legacies of human and non-human life here and now, and then also taking our performance on that challenge as a test of whether we're actually prepared to encounter new life. To sum up, by thinking about contact beyond the acquisition of scientific knowledge, we could shape astrobiology into a scientific practice of cosmic citizenship that begins from a core ethical and methodological framework of protecting life before and during contact, doing no harm, and working for the benefit of all kind everywhere. If we are truly interested in the origins, evolution, distribution, and future of life in the universe, I think we need to be prepared to encounter, respect, and protect that life. Thank you. Okay, questions for our speaker? Okay. And that, that was a lovely talk, and the points were very well taken. Mm -hmm. But you would eliminate an awful lot of scientific discovery if you were really to follow those rules. You right. know, for example, drug testing. Yes, it's better to do that on microbes, but you don't know if the microbes are equivalent to you've done the animal testing. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, it's, it's lovely, but, you know, it just, to someone like me as a lab scientist, it feels like you're throwing sand in my wheels that I can't, right. you know, observing it sounds like going back several hundred years to do my biology rather than being able to get in there, do genetic testing, find out what the tobolones and so on, so that we can really move forward. Absolutely, and historically, um, you know, we used to, take people from prisons and do medical experiments on them. We don't do that anymore. We've found better ways. Fair enough. Okay, so I'm going to follow up on, on Lynn's question. I, mean, mm -hmm. I think one way of putting my, my worry about things like this is that if you impede science, which this will do, it will slow down scientific progress, that will impose a moral cost on human beings, mm -hmm. clearly. It may be difficult to determine exactly how much of a moral cost. Mm -hmm. So why should we assume at the outset that that moral cost is more than balanced out by potential benefits mm -hmm. from treating all animals as if they were intelligent? Right. So um, I'm not actually saying we shouldn't take samples or do the kind of research that we do, but that we should think about how we can build a better way of doing it and build that into how we do astrobiology from the beginning. So one of the things Martine mentioned was uh, the CLIMB system, which was that computationally modeling entire biological systems. And if that sort of system were developed and worked, we could do those drug trials without using animals. And they might be better, faster, more effective, and more accurate, because as she mentioned, it would be modeling it in a human body, not in a, in a mouse. Well, it's just that you have to cut up a lot of animals to make those computational models work. Right, that's that's right. the bottom line. So we're already cutting up a lot of animals. Oh, there's no doubt about that. <laughs> Jay? Yeah, I disagree, Michael, that it would impede science because from what I'm hearing is not so much of rules of behavior as goals to aim for. Like, we all have a goal that we should not lie. That does not mean that sometimes we do not lie <laughs> for a better purpose. But it means that we would hope that one day we would live in a world where we wouldn't have to lie. And so I see this as a wonderful way of being explicit about aspirations, which we're certainly nowhere near getting to now, yeah. but is worthwhile being conscious of. It's definitely a moonshot. 
What was the purple thing? What happened to it? <laughs> Basically a snail. A, volut snail. a volutinate. And why did it uh, turn white and bloated? Uh, I think that's the change in pressure, among other things. Yeah. I mean, it would feel pretty bad if an alien flew down and picked you up and took you to 40,000 feet and dumped you on a table. <laughs> So I, I completely agree that this is the stance we should take uh, by, by default and, you know, and as an aspiration. Uh, what do you do, what strategy do you recommend if um, <coughs> life uh, ends up uh, or turns out to be hostile? Hmm. Well, I think we have to watch and see. I mean, what, what are our current solutions for when human life turns hostile? They're not very good. <laughs> So we have a lot of work to do on that. And we can work on that now and here with the way we interact with other people and the way we interact with life on Earth. And eventually, perhaps a hostile alien life will appear and hopefully we'll have been working on these suggestions that I made and we'll have some good ways of responding. So on that vein, I was wondering if, as an anthropologist, uh, you could share with us an example from history or maybe current events about two disparate cultures coming together following these guidelines and what happened as a result? Yeah. <laughs> we could talk about that later. There are a lot of examples of um, contact, and I'm not sure if we want to use them as analogies here, but we could talk about that. I thought I had a question. Um, my thought is, um, Thinking that I uh, agree with what Jay is saying, I think this would be potentially a really useful guideline mm. in preparing us to think more about the, the moral cost of science in general, right? Um, so maybe the case that right now using animals in laboratories is the best way to um, support the, mo the most amount of human beings, right? Um, but there's no uh, clear benefit to human beings of taking that creature and taking the service and really killing it. Um, so I think that this is a useful approach. Um, I do want to push you a little bit um, to explain more your first point, um, the one about approaching all life as if it has intelligence. Mm -hmm. Do you think that there's something unique about intelligence mm -hmm. um, that would make us value uh, and not want to harm life? Right, so that's a great question and a really big discussion. But what the reason that I use that there is because in this community, a lot of us consider astrobiological encounters with non-intelligence to be very different from those with intelligence. And I'd like to blur that boundary more. Why do you think that's the case? Why do, they, why do people think that? Yeah. Um, they've decided that uh, human-like intelligence is the most important characteristic in life. Um, there's many other reasons, but that's one of them. And I'm not sure if it is. We'll see how we do with the planet, as David demonstrated. <laughs> right. Any other questions for our speaker? Can I complain about people using humans as if they're not animals? They say animals as if they're humans. And humans are very animal. They are animals. Absolutely. So we should not forget that. And we're not just animals, we're aggregates of animals living with a million other animals. <laughs> going to be discussing the emergence of communication in biology and social networks. I'm actually really happy that uh, Michael and Daniela talked before me because I have nonetheless the five computational models for to show for which I didn't cut up any animals. Um, and uh, also to show how communication is a lot about art and intuition and uh, that kind of stuff. Uh, so basically what I want to present today in this talk is a research on communication as a complex process that is likely to separate living from non-living systems regardless of whether they are intelligent or not by loosely defining intelligence. Um, and in complex social systems research, so I'm talking about social, complex social systems research, we are very fond of the idea of scalability or of identifying phenomena that start at the cellular level and propagate non-linearly all the way to the society level. And I believe that communication is such a phenomenon. And we have seen throughout several of the presentations at this workshop um, that uh, the original SETI was uh, based on the idea of communication and that SETI with the C afterwards became SETI. 
Um, what I want to show you here is that while um, we cannot communicate until we find or uh, or uh, we are being found, um, is uh, a kind of a reversal, right? Uh, so in my interdisciplinary work, I like to reverse methodologies for theoretical explorations. And therefore, communication in the living systems on Earth is almost as ubiquitous as information. And the idea behind this research is that perhaps by looking at communication from information theory, complexity theory, and social sciences, uh, we can now discover some fundamental properties or universal markers if we have a better idea about how communication has evolved from cells to societies. And therefore, we are looking at communication as a complex living system. Uh, that can potentially be a liaison between biosignatures and technosignatures. We can use information and uh, we can use examples from information and energy trade. And there was a um, talk yesterday uh, about that and how this is uh, ubiquitous in uh, uh, living systems. Um, and uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about synthetic biology that has been uh, also um, um, has been also talked about uh, here um, in the previous days about artificial intelligence and if I have some time at, at last about communication as a meta science and basically the communication between sciences and uh, what we loosely call interdisciplinarity. Uh, at the basis of this research lies a fundamental question that we tackled in a NACFI uh, workshop at the, the CAC Futures Initiative in uh, 2014 or 2015, um, where we uh, were tasked, we were also in uh, interdisciplinary teams, and we were tasked to find, um, uh, to find the, uh, uh, the answer to this fundamental question. Are there fundamental principles underlying the transition from one to two individuals, and are these scalable to larger groups? Uh, subsequently, in order to parse through such a big question, we need to split it into what biology and sociology can tell us. Uh, therefore, what is the difference in living systems from the bottom up, from cells to plants to organisms and to us? Um, and since we are in the living systems domain, we cannot talk about any scalable phenomenon without talking about its emergence, right? So can we model communication emergence? And so the way we proceeded with a grant from the National Academies of Sciences by modeling communication is by using, again, a reverse methodology. Um, and the way the history of science happened in modern times that is by first understanding the natural world and only afterwards we turn the microscopes and the telescopes towards us. Um, and uh, thus, more often than not, we find methods from the physics and biology that have been transplanted into the study of so social sciences and particularly in economics. But nowadays, the social sciences have made great strides, both theoretically and methodologically, and I like to think of the ecosystem of sciences as interacting with each other at a deeper level than just borrowing methods from one another. Consequently, in the information age, I believe that we have lots of interesting findings with respect to information science and economics of information that we can use back to understand the natural world at large. And this is the new proposal for studying communication, uh, where communication is a versatile process that can be as heterogeneous as the communicators and as adaptive and as evolving as them. Can be a differentiator between living and non-living systems if we include technology as an extension of the living systems. It is necessary for collective behavior, uh, from multicellularity to societies to robotic swarms and collective algorithms, and who studied collective behavior better than social sciences. And let's explore a theoretical model, and I'll show you a computational model that we also did that includes the properties of heterogeneity and subjectivity of information, as well as adaptability selection, and selection characteristics to life. And uh, this information ex exchange can be adapted to cells interacting um, to, with each other, organism signaling, human languages, and computer-computer interactions. And let's also track the differences between organisms that have the ability to change the rules by which they exchange information and organisms that only react to stimuli. In any science that has been studying communication or information exchange, the conceptual framework is universal. There is a sender, a receiver, and a message. But if we think in more details about refining this method, uh, or this framework to better describe the large spectrum of biological, social, and technological systems, we, thought we can incorporate concepts of individual maps, or chemistries, or cognitive concepts, 
as well as incentives and constraints for metabolic costs and benefits. And from the information economic theory point of view, um, uh, information is subjective, it's heterogeneous, it's a process, it's no rivals, you can give it the cake and keep it too. Uh, it's non-excludable, once it's out there, you cannot take it back. If I tell you, don't think about pink elephants, what are you going to think about? Pink elephants, okay. But we also model information as network topology where the nodes are information, links are information, and networks are information. So this leads us to a model of information um, as uh, uh, networks of networks. And uh, in the agent based model that we, uh, that we used as a framework for uh, modeling uh, communication, we looked at uh, four types of communication or scenarios, network to network or if you want organism to organism, network to environment, a random choice between one and two, it can be randomized, but also a selective choice between number one and number two based on an opportunity cost or an expected net benefit or basically the choice of communication. And we also had parameters for on and off switches for cognitive processes with memory decay or threatening, with physical processes, with half-life physical decays, and economic and metabolic co uh, processes of cost and benefit exchange. Okay, so this is how the simulation looks like. Um, and uh, we can track basically here the metabolic cost and benefits or the cognitive cost and benefits, as well as the amount of information that is being exchanged in the system. The system is also scalable to more than two individuals by preserving the same rules of pairwise communication. And the beauty of this kind of simulation is that we, we can explore the entire parameter space and all possible scenarios in all combinations possible of all the variables that we have in the system and then analyze these results. In a way, you can think about this model as your own little universe where you can create the rules and the actors and then sit back and observe emergent phenomena. In our case, the results show that only the adaptive and selective information exchange leads to the Z flaw. The Z flaw is the power law with the exponent of minus one that has been observed to universally characterize human languages as well as dolphin communication. And the selective communication scenario where the ontological networks choose intrinsically or cognitively to exchange information with the environment or with their peer is the one that exhibits the most information exchange and the highest net benefit or metabolic information than any other type of communication scenario. We validated this model at a high level with the distribution of gene signaling and chemicals. In gene signaling studies, there is one molecule that seems to be crucial for signaling regardless of the cell or organism called CAMP. Uh, and which can be induced both in the lab and in the simulations. Perhaps it's no coincidence that Alan Turing, the father of modern computing, studied both information theory and morphogenesis, and now we are see there are significant advances in DNA computing as well. So why simulations and they are AI, we can uh, therefore start to think more deeply about information theoretic models that can be indicative of life. These are certainly indicative of some fundamental laws that are persistent in living system systems or in the universe. For example, on the left side, we have a computer simulation of the shelling segregation patterns in social systems. It is also similar to cellular automata, which are algorithms that follow simple rules of behavior, but display complex emergent patterns, um, or can be similar to patterns of cellular activities in molecular biology or patterns of animal migrations. Um, one avenue through which we have also thought about using AI to tackle some of these big problems and questions in science is the NASA Frontier Development Lab, a research accelerator in partnership with NASA and the SETI Institute, and that takes place each summer in Mountain View and where teams of data scientists and planetary space scientists get together to tackle, to tackle really big problems using AI-specific techniques. The problem we tackled last year using data science is the answer to this very tiny question, what is universally possible for life? And we were given the plentiful time of eight weeks to do it. <laughs> so when we are talking about an AI accelerator for astrobiology, the first thing we um, would need would be data, lots and lots of data. There is no deep learning or machine learning algorithm that we can do without that. But the problem we had was obviously the sample of one. And great, how can we use one data point to train and test our algorithms? And the answer is to generate and simulate lots of data. <coughs> Since I'm running out of time, I'm going to skip through this very quickly. Um, so we used the several layers 
of inference in this project and there were two parts of the project, the macro level where we simulated atmospheres and the micro level where we simulated metabolic networks data. Um, and we tied these in, we simulated more than 250,000 atmospheres in different combinations of different um, uh, greenhouse gases. Um, and uh, we used the Atmos code that was developed by NASA Goddard. Um, and some of these results from these synthetic atmospheres gave us information about planet surface temperatures. The code and the data are available online in GitHub, and we also infer statistically how many potential planets are in the habitability parameters at the atmospheres and planet temperatures. And the second part of the data simulation is, of course, about the metabolic networks, where we took the CAG data of chemical components and created biological metabolic networks based on the genome of E. coli as we created synthetic E. coli genomes. We generated 500 types of synthetic <coughs> genomes altering the E. coli uh, as they would be able to feed in any combination of the greenhouse gases. And basically skipping through all of these, um, we tied the, um, uh, the genomes with um, another aging-based model, uh, Exogaia, that was developed by Tim Lenton. And this is how we made the link between synthetic biologies and synthetic atmospheres. Um, and in the end, the results we observed how different metabolisms are related to planetary biomass and planetary temperatures. So we had several layers through which we looked at chemical networks, metabolic networks, universal genomes, planetary temperatures and biomass and planet atmospheres. And I would like to go back a little bit to the starting idea of communication as a complex system and, and to the fact that communication is more likely a feature of life that changes with life. It's also a posteriori knowledge. Uh, we study communication or refine communication through science. Uh, but it's also a priori, so we can think of communication as a priori uh, knowledge, particularly as humans, we uh, communicate also through symbols, emotions, empathy, introspection, and this means that we can create and discover knowledge by sharing internal subjective experiences. This means that in the case of communication and information exchange, we need to look both at the means of communication and the meaning of communication. Shannon's famous formula for information in entropy here on the left laid out the foundations for communicating in bits of ones and zeros, but he also said that the actual meaning of the message cannot be communicated in uh, this way. Um, here is an example where we have a picture by P where we have a painting by Piet Mondrian on the left, but we have an AI composition, a deep learning algorithm that uh, did a similar composition on, on the right. And I'm going to go a little bit faster through this so we can think of different patterns of communication from natural to artifactual. We have the mammalian brain, of the brain of the mouse as a representation on the left, and the internet uh, with different hubs on, on the right. Um, most living beings on Earth communicate through natural means, such as chemicals or signals, and only as humans, we have so far developed artifactual means of communications, such as writing, painting, computing. Uh, we can also think about communication scalability from local to global patterns. <coughs> um, and again, from an evolutionary <coughs> standpoint, does this mean that more trivial or ubiquitous communication is the, uh, uh, that uh, are, is the one that can lead us to actually find some universal patterns. For example, a Mandelbrot fractal is perceived differently by a mathematician than by someone with no knowledge of fractal geometry, while the symbol on the right is perhaps more intuitively understood by most people on Earth. Similarly, the plot on the left communicates a famous theory in macroeconomics um, that only economists would understand, while the symbol on the right would reach more people due to the globalization of certain economic phenomena on our planet. This means that perhaps we can develop universal markers, signals, and systems, and we have been doing it through science standardizations, but I'm hoping we will be able to take a deeper look at classifying communication by using some of the newest computational techniques available to us now. And I am awfully out of time. Um, one thing I'd like to also mention is uh, about communication pathologies. Uh, the fact that uh, when it comes to communication, miscommunication or the absence of communication is also communication, so that's a very particular feature in which we can think about communication. And just to, uh, to end with uh, communication as a meta-science and about interdisciplinarity, and particularly interdisciplinarity <laughs> with economics. So why economics? These are just 
some examples. And of course, there are several other examples. I just want to leave you with the last slide. And basically, this one with potential economics and complex systems research areas into astrobiology, which by no means are extensive here, and there are so numerous, and nobody has approached them so far. Thank you. So I got stuck all the way in the beginning of your talk with the simulation that you showed. Yep. Um, could you go back and explain a little bit slower what you were showing there? I can actually show you the actual simulation. Um, <clears throat> um, let's see, that should be here. <laughs> Give me just a second. Um, so basically what we created um, okay. I, I, need a, I need a minute. So basically what we created is a uh, simulation where organisms, whether you are thinking about cells or individuals, um, they are defined as networks. And these networks are um, <laughs> concepts of memes, if you, can, if you want to think about that, or, um, or chemical concepts, and they start interacting uh, with each other. Um, and I need a minute to find it. Uh, maybe you're not sharing it. Yeah, I know. Okay. Just give me one second. Maybe we can discuss this online. Yeah, we can just, yeah. I'm just checking. Okay. This should be, this should work. This version, I'm hoping it should work. Yeah. So basically, in the simulation, so here it is. Um, okay. Uh, we can create uh, a number of networks, two or three, right, which can be approximated for organisms. So let's say two. Um, and uh, you can think of these as uh, concepts or memes. Um, they are normalized to 100. So you can choose, let's say, fewer memes. So they are more sparse. Uh, there is a probability of connection, so they can be more connected or less connected. And this is how they would look like, right? If they are less connected or more connected. Um, you can choose whether there is a search cost that we, uh, associate, associated with communication, whether you are searching for a particular piece of information or not. So again, whether you are a cell or an organism or a human. Um, you can choose to have uh, forgetfulness as we humans have. Maybe it's a computer, so we can choose not. Uh, we can choose the same to have some, uh, some of these concepts strengthened. The more you, you use a particular language or a particular science, you're going to be more strengthened in, in, that, uh, in that science. Or, uh, for instance, my second language was French, and I'm forgetting it because I'm not using it anymore. Um, and you can choose who starts the actual communication, right? Which of, the, uh, which of these networks. Uh, and there are also uh, different types of communication methods that I was showing. So you can have peer-to-peer, peer-to-environment. You can randomly choose if you are a computer, you're, maybe you randomly choose. If you are a living a system, maybe uh, it's going to be more selective. And then just start communicating. And what you are tracking, basically, with this is the cost of communication, as well as how much communication is being done in the system. All right, let's thank our speaker. All right, our next speaker is going to be um, Charlie Lineweaver, who is going to discuss, is human-like intelligence a uh, convergent feature of evolution? Yes, I'm Charlie Lineweaver, um, and 
so the question is, human-like intelligence of convergent future of evolution. So who am I? Well, I'm known for a couple of papers. Uh, I wanted to show you one paper here, and that is the age distribution of terrestrial planets in the universe. Basically, in this third panel here, this black line is the age distribution that we've estimated for uh, terrestrial planets. And here's where the sun is. So most of these are here. And so there has been plenty of time for life to have evolved elsewhere. The mean of this distribution is about 2 billion years older than the Earth. So this is uh, done a long time ago, 2001, when we thought the age of the universe was 13.4 billion. Now we know it's 13.8. The one, can, one thing you can say is that if life is common in the universe, as suggested by the rapid appearance of life on Earth, then this age distribution gives us an idea of how we compare to other life that may have evolved in the universe. Uh, also, I did a paper on the galactic habitable zone published in Science in 2004, and I'd be happy to talk to you about that, those, any of those two papers. So let's go back to this question. This is a very important question for people who are doing SETI and people who are wondering about whether we're alone in the universe. Uh, so Hollywood is already convinced that human-like intelligence, these big brains, are common because I think a large fraction of the aliens that you see on TV have big brains. Uh, now, this, this is, a, is an old issue, a relatively old issue, in the sense that in 1995 there was a back and forth between Ernst Mayer, a biologist, and Carl Sagan on this. Ernst Mayer says, no, no, we're, uh, human-like intelligence is not a convergent feature of evolution. And Carl says, of course it is. It's better to be smart than stupid. Um, uh, so in general, you can characterize this that if biologists in general say no, is like Ernst Mayer, that uh, human-like intelligence is not a convergent feature of evolution. We should not expect evolution in general to produce human-like intelligence. And physicists in Hollywood say, yes, it is. On the other hand, we heard from Lynn earlier, and I put Lynn over here with Simon Conway Mars. I like these people very much, but I disagree with them very strongly on this issue. The Bible of Convergence, if you were interested, it's called Life Solution, Inevitable Humans in a Lonely Universe. The paradoxical nature of that title kind of summarizes a lot of the sense of humor and paradox in Simon kind of Mars. Other people who are on the other side, Ernst Mayer, but also Stephen Jay Gould and a few of these people, you might talk about convergentists over here and people who believe in deep homology over on that side. Uh, I showed this in my flash talk, and I think this is very important because we're trying to, we're talking about life in the universe, and here is what we know about life. This is the latest phylogenetic tree that I can come up with, 2018 Castell and Banfield. And it's really important that the latest things that we've detected metagenomically are this new group, CPR, candidate phylum radiation right here. And notice that they are deeply rooted. If Luca, the last universal common ancestor, is here, then these are not only monophyletic, but they're very deeply rooted and close to what we think is Luca. And here in the Archaea, we have a new group called Dpan. They too, they're not monophyletic, but they are deeply rooted along this line uh, towards Luca. And that's something that's very important. And uh, we in this room are over here, the eukaryotes here. Now, often in the convergentist literature, you will come across sentences like this. Unrelated species convergently evolve X. And I think even a biologist, non-biologist, will know that there are no such things as unrelated species. Since all life has a common origin, there are no unrelated species. I can vouch that I have seen this sentence, unrelated species, about to, at least a dozen times in literature. Now, another thing you need to recognize that in order to converge, you first need to diverge. This is particularly important if you have a common origin. You have to diverge, and once you've quantified the divergence, only then can you talk about convergence. You can't pretend that they're completely independent and then say, oh, everything, how they become similar is convergence. That doesn't work. Uh, I should also point out that in this diagram here, the eukaryotes are here, but we know a lot more about the details here, and here are eukaryotes. Remember, these are critters with nuclei. The DNA is, in a, is that inside of a membrane. Now, Interestingly, let's look a little closer. There are where the heads, that's the only place on the eukaryotes where there are heads in the bilateria. So if you're interested in, in intelligence, you might also be interested in heads. Are heads a com uh, convergent feature of evolution? Now what, why that's interesting is because heads, there were every single one of these branch points, there is one species which then diverged. So every single one of them is Species specific. 
The, the reason I say that is because we see heads everywhere. We think, oh, they're everywhere, therefore they're genetic. But heads used to be the property of only one species. That's what the word monophyletic means. Uh, everything that currently has a head used to, had a common ancestor. And that common ancestor is some, right about there. Now that, I think, is an important piece of information if you, because you just walk around the world thinking, oh, everything has a head, therefore the aliens have heads. Almost all aliens, like 99% like of Hollywood aliens have heads. Even the arrival ones that were, I guess, have been touted because they look more like octopi than vertebrates have heads. Now, so I've already said that this is monophyletic. Now, convergent arguments are important to astro biology and SETI because if we can show that biological evolution on Earth produced the same feature multiple times independently, and I emphasize independently because that doesn't exist in biology. It exists in dice. If you roll dice, the next one will be independent. We physicists and mathematics, mathematically, we know what independent means, but the biologists think as soon as two things have diverged and no longer reproduce with each other, they're supposed to be independent. Now that is a really, that's a poor man's version of independence. Okay, so then the feature becomes a good candidate for what we should expect elsewhere. So we're trying to get help from biologists to figure out what we should, what kind of life forms we expect elsewhere. We have to look for these major patterns and we have to be very careful about what these major patterns are saying because of that, that problem. Now here's another problem. The independence between the two species on Earth that we're trying to say, oh, they converge on something, that independence needs to be maximum possible to make convergence on Earth relevant to alien life. Remember, we're trying to take two, two species here. I mean, for example, what Lynn mentioned the, uh, two days ago, all of the examples she mentioned were convergence within this much, right there. And as you can see, that those all those examples are very, very, very correlated with each other because of the long history, four billion years ago to about anywhere from 50 million years ago to 100 million years. That is an important piece of information. So when you see somebody say convergent, please think about these details because it matters. If, if you're interested in whether we should or should not expect human-like intelligence elsewhere. Now, the Planet of the Apes movie this is the original and uh, I mention this because we here we have a human being who knows how to talk, and these uh, these three apes these three ape species have taken over the earth. They've essentially are now the inhabitants of the supposed intelligence niche. Now I call this the human, the planet of the apes hypothesis. It goes something like this: There is a human-like intelligence niche. There is selection pressure on other species, including our ancestors, to occupy this niche. In our absence, in a terrestrial setting, or on other planets, some species will evolve into that niche and develop technology. Carl Sagan has called the occupants of this niche the functional equivalent of humans. Now, about 18 years ago, I was on a plane with Frank, and uh, I was sitting next to him in a plane. I was very happy. I'd never met Frank Drake before. And I started teaching a course called Are We Alone? And here I was, an astrophysicist, cosmologist, teaching a course called Are We Alone? I had the advantage that my dad was a high school biology teacher, so I really did grow up with skeletons in the closet. But I said, <laughs> I said, Frank, why do you think there are intelligent aliens who have built radio telescopes? What do you think is the strongest evidence for the idea that human-like intelligence is a convergent feature of evolution? And in, in Frank's insightful way, he said, read Harry Jerison. I'd never heard of Harry Jerison, so I looked up Harry Jerison, He's a paleoneurologist, and what he does is goes around measuring the sizes of brains and bodies, estimating them based on the skulls and the bones that have been found in the past. So here's the main take-home plot from Jerison. So here's today, here's 50 million years ago, 100 million years ago, 200 million years ago, and this is encephalization quotient. So essentially the size of your, the mass of your brain divided by the mass of your body. And here are we, Right here, the hummings. And uh, this y-axis has been created because we think we're special about this. You could ask ourselves, why are we so good? Uh, why are we so unique? And one of the, the most common answers to that question is, we have the highest EQ. Of course, they're competing, we're being competed with, with the cetaceans, for example. But 
What kind of way is that to, to analyze? I would maintain that this is not evidence that um, human-like intelligence or high EQ is a convergent feature of evolution. Why do I say that? Well, consider the nasalization question. <laughs> you're, you're an elephant, you're an elephant, and you look around, you know, I have thousands of traits. Which is the best one? What makes me better than all the other species? Because I think I'm better, I know I'm better. What is it? He's like, oh, you know, I have really thick skin, but that rhinoceros may be more. I have a longer nose compared to my body than any other animal. So what do I do? I create a y-axis that looks like that. And this is the relative nose size, the nasalization quotient. And I plot myself because I've chosen that y-axis up here. And then I ask myself, what does the data look like into the past? Well, it'll look like this. That does not mean that there is a trend among other species. It means that there's a trend in the lineage to you, but you have chosen yourself to be there. That's a subtle selection effect, but I hope it's not so subtle that you, it, it, uh, you can't understand it. Now, Richard Dawkins, in his inimitable way, says, elephant astronomers might wonder whether on some other world there exist alien forms that have crossed the nasal Rubicon and taken the final leap to full probosity. <laughs> So what about dolphins? In this map, you know, there's the cetaceans there. And people have often cited big brain dolphins, because they, you can see they also have a large EQ. What about that? Isn't that a case of the convergence of another independent species? Now, I say independent because our common ancestors, it's very important here. You look, if you say species A and species B converge on something, what you have to do is look at their common ancestor, however far that was, 5 million, 10 million, 100 million, ask the question, is the trait that you're thinking of having converged at all relevant? Is it already present in the common ancestor? And almost, well, inevitably, some part, particularly the most basic part of the trait you're interested in, is already there in the common ancestor. That means the most fundamental part of what the convergence that you're interested in is already there. It's not convergence at all. Now, there are some bells and whistles, but Look at this. We, we know that about 95 million years ago, this should be 95, not 75, because we have better data now. We know that 95 million years ago, we're very sure that the common ancestor of humans and dolphins did not have a large brain. We didn't, we, I mean, we were identical then, and then we diverged. They had a large brain faster, and we would took our time. Uh, now, what, what do I say about that? How do you explain that? If that's not convergence, what is? Well, this is how I understand that. Here's the origin of life 4 billion years ago, 3 billion, 2 billion, 1 billion. Here's the approximately 100 million year divergence time between us and dolphins. That had a small brain, and both of these have big brains. The reason why I will not say that this is an independent, convergent evolution on a big brain is because during almost 4 billion years, you, we were identical. During 4 billion years, a whole lot of stuff evolved, including all of the ways that your body has, uh, it controls itself the, during embryogenesis, which grows big. Once you have a nose or ears in place, it's not an a, it's not a independent uh, evolution. It's not something independent to say, oh, I have, a conver I have 10 switches here. I'm just going to boop, 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 boop. And you will convergently, randomly, come upon something like the increase in size of a particular organ who has a basis Four bit for four billion years. What I'm saying is there are, once you share that long a time period as in identity, you have a lot of the same features. For example, you notice they both have two eyes, they're both animals, they have a nose, a nose here, and they're even uh, tetrapods, because uh, underneath, uh, well, they used to be cows or something like that. Okay, how long did it take us to get such big brains? The answer there is about two to three million years. Here is cranial capacity, here's time, three million years ago, two million years ago, this is today. So we look at our ancestors, look at fossils, that's what you get. So, this, so that's the time period that you should keep in your head for how long did it take us to get so brainy. Our brains went like this, and a factor of three increase in about three million years. Now, in an important way, the Earth is not a sample of one. Often you'll hear, oh, the Earth is a sample of one, you can't say anything from that. Well, in terms of landlocked vertebrates, you can say a lot about this because, in terms of land-like vertebrates, these continents 
Here are the other continents today. There's Madagascar and Australia and New Zealand and South America. So there have been half a dozen long duration experiments in vertebrate evolution that have been independent of each other and have already tested the planet of the apes hypothesis. So for example, here's 200 million years ago, here's today. And the length of these lines tells you how long these particular continents and islands have been independent. Notice New Zealand on the right uh, is very long and independent. As a matter of fact, uh, so you can ask yourself, if there is such a thing as a human intelligence niche, what, during these 200 million years, or 100, or 50, or 80, when you know what, in our case at least, it took about two or three million years to triple in size, if that was such an important thing, if brain size and being smart was so important, you would expect something during this independence to have evolved into this intelligence niche. So then you look around and say, okay, what, what is it that is a native species to New Zealand that has the biggest EQ or the smartest thing? And uh, these are the kiwi or a tuatara. Birds are hard to do because they are not isolated to the island. And what you're trying to do is make a test that, of things that are isolated. Okay, and then here's what uh, Jared Diamond has said. New Zealand is as close as we will get to the opportunity to study life on another planet, simply because it's pretty isolated. And I think Jared Diamond is here getting congratulated for, why is sex fun, I think. <laughs> so, what, anyway, what, so the idea is what filled the intelligence niche in New Zealand? And how about Australia? Australia has been independent of other places for about 80 million years or so. And, you know, I don't know. What's your candidate for the best, smartest thing? The human like intelligence niche, the thing that has shown at least a little bit of evolution towards this intelligence niche that we pretend is there. And what I'm trying to show you is that these examples are, are kind of counter examples to your, uh, your pretense that such a uh, human like intelligence niche exists. Here's what happened in Madagascar, uh, maybe the lemur ring tailed lemurs, maybe Indian Asia. Maybe this fellow, maybe in South America. All these are independent laboratories that were experiments that give us results on what does evolution do in the long term for vertebrates. And you do not see evidence for, uh, for evolution towards human-like intelligence. Anyway, so, so you don't see occupants. Now, some people say, oh, you don't see occupants because we are the first and we have suppressed or killed the others. Well, that doesn't work because Humans weren't even on these other continents and islands until a thousand or fifty thousand years ago. That's tiny, that's nothing, that's peanuts. That's less than a million. Therefore, we could not have suppressed them until very recently. According to the Planet of the Apes hypothesis, we should see evidence for evolution towards the human like intelligence. We don't. Someone doesn't, and also I've heard, well, you know, we're the first. Someone's got to be first. I say, no, someone does not have to be the first sulfur crested cockatoo or the first Indian elephant or the first human like intelligence. Species are not inevitable. By saying someone has got to be first, you are assuming what we're trying to test. So I've heard several people say this over the you know, 20 years. Our existence proves that the universe can produce technological civilizations. I say, no, let's be more careful. We're scientists. Our existence proves that the universe has produced a technological civilization. Notice the big difference here. There's a big difference in the implications of that sentence there's an S here, and there's a can produce here, and there's a has produced A. Now that may be a small detail, but I, over and over again, people use language that implies that, ah, you get it once, you get it, well, you know, like, well, let me go on. <laughs> the existence of Indian elephants, sulfur crested cockatoos, and New Zealand proves that the universe has produced Indian elephants, sulfur crested cockatoos, and New Zealand. That does not mean you should go hunting for Indian elephants or New Zealand. So what I'm, I'm talking about here is what I call quirkometry. Now quirkometry in details, all kinds of wonderful details about New Zealand that I'm sure are unique in the universe. But you could also say, wait a minute, what's New Zealand? It's a rocky island in an ocean. This is like the generic thing that we have a right to believe exists elsewhere, and this we do not. So are humans quirky like New Zealand or generic like a rocky island in an ocean? So I think the bottom line is uh, humans are unique just like every other species on Earth. It makes no sense to concoct an imaginary set of which we are the only terrestrial member and then suppose that biological evolution elsewhere in the universe evolves toward this set. This concoction is the plan of the apes hypothesis. It is testable. Paleo-neurology does not support it. 
half a dozen multi-million year experiments in vertebrate evolution are the best data we have to test it, not our notion that, oh, it's better to be smart. This is data. They suggest that there is no functional equivalent humans in the universe. This explains the great silence. And yet I, I support SETI very much because when we have the technology to cheaply explore new parameter space, we should do it. I think null results are important. The universe may be stronger than we can imagine, and I may be wrong about the planet of the apes. <laughs> Uh, so here's uh, Christopher Columbus exploring new parameter space, Pentheus and Wilson exploring new parameter space. If you want to know more, this is an article that I wrote a few years ago on this topic. Uh, one thing I should, a couple more details. Are we alone? Well, who is we? I've done a survey of this question and people, about a third of people think we means we humans. Well, then the question is easy because humans are not alone on Earth. So we're not alone in the universe. That's the answer to the question for a third of the people. They're very unsatisfied with that answer. <laughs> Here is the, what I call the Schwarzeneggerization of the universe, <laughs> of, of life. And this is, you can see this, this uh, bodybuilder here is the be all and end all of evolution. goes right from here to here. That's the purpose of evolution. This is not, I mean, we laugh at that, but I, I would suggest that we're not that much better in terms of what we expect from the universe. Schwarzeneggerization of life. And vanity is what I'm smelling here. And I think that uh, our closest relatives in the universe are here on Earth. Also, communication with extraterrestrial intelligence, I was excited to learn that it went from C to S, went from communication to search. But I think if we want to be accurate and precise and good scientists, instead of having to worry about what is intelligence, well, the search for extraterrestrial electrical engineers. <laughs> That's what we're doing. If you want to be honest about what SETI is doing, then you don't have to worry about everything I just said about whether this is what we're looking for, and we know that electrical engineers are species-specific <laughs> and uh, probably a non-convergent feature of the... Oh, um, anything else? Oh, I used to think the brain was the most important organ until I realized what was telling me that. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and I think, for some reason, I, I, I am a little bit of a fan of... Viral viruses being important, particularly in the RNA world scenario. I think that RNA world scenario is a, a viral world. And this is for Kelly. Kelly attempts to define the life, to define life, do not help to understand the origin, but this is Jack Sostak. It's a two page article. Take, read it, it's very important. <laughs> and uh, here we have, not that I wrote it, I kind of like, I kind of define life as far from equilibrium dissipated systems. And I said, we have not detected extraterrestrial life, or have we? So if we redefine life, we've already found it everywhere. So that's the, I, I'm convinced that we don't know what life is and we don't know what intelligence is. So I'm not sure what I'd say here. So thank you very much. How do you know human life intelligence has not evolved in New Zealand in the last hundred million years? In the last hundred million years? Yeah. Well, you said that you're, that you're, what you're piece what, of your thesis right. there. So what you're saying is the fossil record is sparse. How do you know? Well, yeah. the fossil record is sparse. You're right. So, and you, so you do. Well, okay. If you want to get a grant to look for a human, no, just, big brain things. Well, let's say this. Wait a minute. We have found lots and lots and lots of fossils, right? With skulls, I mean, that's how Jarrison made his living. He did not find one that went poof off the chart that was higher than ours. So out of the, I don't know, let's say 10,000 examples of life in different parts of the universe, there aren't not many fossils in, uh, in, uh, in New Zealand. But if it had such a big brain, what happened to it? Aren't we supposed to keep you alive, these brains, right? Or well, so things go extinct. Yes, they do. I said, yes. 100 million so, years is a long time. So the incompleteness is an issue, of course. But you, what the, what's important here is you do the best you can with the data you have. And vanity is not a replacement for data. <laughs> <laughs> Interesting that you sort of criticize people being careless with language when, in fact, you are a little careless. Oh, tell me, tell me, tell me. Uh, so, so, so when I say that something can happen, I don't mean it's likely to happen or it's going to happen a lot. If it happens once, it could happen, right? Right, so, right, of course. But, so. but, but what we need to do is think about what how generic are the things we point out? For example, the English language that we're speaking now, or the Zulu language. Most people agree that we should not go looking for aliens who speak Zulu. Why is that? Because our sense is, wait a minute, any particular human language is so quirky, we should not expect it elsewhere. But then we take human-like intelligence and say, oh, it's generic, it's so good, and we pretend there's a giant set, but it's really species-specific to us. Unless you say, well, wait a minute, everything is intelligent because everything is staying alive with some kind of, a lot of things with neural systems. So that, that's when it becomes problematic, is 
you know, what's intelligence? I don't know. IQ test is, you know. Can, can is a, a more meager claim than it even happened once. Because something can happen even if it hasn't happened yet. So, so I think it's, it's, people that say can, they're probably the ones that are there because they're meaning something much more powerful than that. Yes, so, yes. That's my favorite. All right, last question. It's hard to make this brief. And you're a very hard act to sort of follow a challenge. Are there just a couple things that I, that I do want to say, though. Um, so this is coming from the perspective of somebody who's actually you know, also done some work in this area. Um, so first of all, the origination of that dispute, you know, so it wasn't just mayor, it was also um, George Gaylord Simpson and that kind of dispute. It was about, you know, it was back in the day, it was about fundamentally, is study worthwhile or not? And I would say, a um, horse gate open, gone, done, right? So I don't actually think there's a whole lot of point in kind of revisiting kind of the origins of that, of that particular debate, because whether or not um, uh, paleontologists consider SETI to be pursuit worthy, um, it's happening, <laughs> right? So right, really I'm, in, I'm in favor of SETI, but sure, not yeah. for the major motivation that most people have about it. Sure, yeah, I, I also think actually that SETI has evolved considerably in terms of its thinking about the kind of um, intelligence that, that, that could conceivably be out there. But there's a, another kind of side to this that I, I just do want to flag. Um, and I'm struggling for diplomatic words. Um, <laughs> no, I'm not and, diplomatic. You don't have to be. All right. Thank, thank I you. dish it out. Thank I you for your permission, it. Charlie. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to kind of give up on the diplomacy. I think that this is not a good use of the biological record of evolution of intelligence on Earth. And that was kind of the fundamental um, proposition that Lori Marino, whose work I believe you are aware of, mm -hmm. um, kind of approached all of this with when we were doing a project which was funded by the NAI. Um, and we didn't publish as much as we would have liked to because we both got assigned to but we ran a series of workshops at Outside Con and we did a couple of projects. And it was all about, well, what can we use the record of evolution of intelligence and communication, et cetera, on Earth for? Um, and it's, um, Lori also did some specific work which certainly superseded Jerison's um, regarding encephalization quotient and things like that. And, right, and Ross has done that more of well. Yeah, then she also found you know, some interesting passive trends um, <clears throat> and there have been a lot more skulls found on the human side since 1991 as well. So there's kind of a, a lot more nuance we can go into there. But the basic thing is like, okay, well, if all we can learn from the history of, I don't know, cephalopods, elephants, avians, etc., is that they're not like humans, why do we bother? You think that's what I said? No, but I'm just saying that, that you know, kind of the formulation of the question, um, it's, it's still so anthropocentric. It's just revolving around, um, you know, whether or not the universe would replicate us. And so if we're going to flip this on, on its head and kind of ask a different question, which is the one that I personally favor, which is why I'm you know, giving this little speech here, is, um, so let's say the study does find something. Yeah, we can safely assume that it's not human in origin, but what, what could we potentially infer from any kind of details about it? And in order to um, kind of back kind of backfill, you know, so you know, we've got some data coming in, there's some characteristics to the signal, there's something. And one thing that we know is that we will have to think really hard in order to discern anything about what or who might have produced that. And so I think in order to use all the data that we have at our disposal to kind of work towards that question, it's a really different approach. So that's kind of what I would um, hope that we might be able to use the incredible um, biodiversity on this earth towards us to help us to learn more about the general phenomena. So. All right, let's thank our speaker. I think we're going to get started. Now, I know we're going to get started. Okay, so I'm going to present a little bit here about a format because I really wish there are really good, solid questions that I think uh, could be controversial, will be controversial, that I wish to get through all of them, at least to some degree. So the format I have laid out here is that each of the panel members, and here we have our names, are going to introduce themselves, say a little bit about themselves. Then, after that, I'm going to then ask everyone to, I'm going to we have a series of questions. I'm going to have everyone uh, read their question and give a couple of minutes or so on their question and then probably if anybody has a quick comment to comment on it. And then as we go through all of that, what I wish to do is I'm going to list all the questions and open it up for discussion so we can discuss everything. 
And in addition to that, if somebody has some question that they wish to be discussed, we can do that as well. And I'm going to make it so that everybody comments just briefly as we first go through, sort of as a teaser. And then you can, if you have a desire or burning question, then hold that in in anticipation. And maybe your anticipation will grow so that you will get that question even better than you had originally formed. Okay, and with that, I will first introduce, at that end, we have Cassie. Cassie, would you like to say a little bit about yourself? And, and then we'll go on to Kelly. Uh, so well, we've already introduced you, but go ahead yeah, and say yeah, something I mean, more. You heard me talk about the job I used to have. My research is looking at uh, organisms in extreme environments, understanding how organisms adapt to microgravity, and in addition, developing a statistical framework for understanding how to go about assuring confidence in a claimed detection of extraterrestrial life. I worked with Andrew Steele at the Carnegie Institution of Washington, who actually did the debunking of the Allen Hills meteorite, if you want to frame it that way. And I will have a lightning talk tomorrow that's describing a little bit more about some of the work that is just addressing, that I actually, my recent actual research project. Kelly. Well, I'm Kelly Smith, philosopher from Clemson, and you already heard me talk about weird conceptual stuff, and now I'm going to talk about weird ethical stuff. <laughs> David. I'm David Tatel. I'm a federal judge on the U.S. Court of Appeals in Washington. I've had a long lifetime interest in science and SETI. Um, my court hears many cases involving scientific issues. And I chair a committee at the National Academy on Science and Technology. But well, my real, my real credential for being here is it was my father who designed the first infectious uh, but I'd like to add, in addition, that I think we actually do need somebody in this room who knows something about legal opinions and a legal expert who can keep us from going awry or astray. Because we sometimes often do that, especially when we are in regards to something that requires uh, actual legal opinion. So, with that, we'll go to, uh, let's see, who are you? Oh! <laughs> Good point! Pay no attention to that man behind the curtain. The man behind the curtain. Uh, I'm, I'm Rocco Mancinelli. I really uh, I am a microbial ecologist. I spent several years working in the field of environmental microbiology and looking at halophiles and looking at microbes in extreme environments. I studied microbes from the hot springs of Yellowstone National Park all the way to the uh, organisms that inhabit the perennially ice-covered lakes in the dry valleys of Antarctica and several places in between. In, in addition to that, what I'm doing primarily right now is we call it space microbiology. That is, I fly microbes in spacecraft and outside spacecraft and when we do an outside spacecraft, I look at what kills them, why they die, how they die, how fast they die, what makes them not die. And inside spacecraft, we look at the, the effects of microgravity. I look at the effects of microgravity. Right now we have a whole ecosystem that we're flying, so I'm looking at the effects of microgravity of the moon and Mars on ecosystem development and biogeochemical cycles. And I'm also looking at how microbes respond to microgravity to form or not form biofilms. Uh, and so that is really what I do. What am I doing here on ethical, moral, and legal issues? What else do you do? Well, I've also done a little bit of work on planetary protection. I've also done a little bit of work on uh, looking at, and I've actually run other little bits of of uh, workshops that actually look at some of the ethical and moral issues of, of looking at organisms <coughs> on other planets as well. You also added things to Oh, thank you. That's my other job. My other <laughs> job is I'm also the editor-in-chief of the International Journal of Astrobiology. And I have approached several of you here to see whether or not you would be interested in actually writing an article on what you have stated here or anything else that you're really interested in. And I open that up to everybody else here to see whether or not you want to 
submit an article for IJA, all you have to do is talk to me at any time during the meeting or send me an email. Now, with that, I will get on to our very first question here. And our first question <clears throat> is from David. And let's see if I can get this to go properly here. Aha! It works. Is it up? Uh, yes, it is. It's up there. OK. <clears throat> so uh, before I talk about the question, let me uh, say one or two things about why I wrote the question the way I did. Um, it says, how do we decide whether, whether to apply the law, and if so, how? I didn't ask the question, does the law apply to extraterrestrial life? Because I don't think we've decided that question. And the issue that to me is far more interesting is how does a society like ours, one that is based on the rule of law, how do we make those decisions? So that's why it's a process question, not an outcome question. The second thing about the question is that notice it says law, not morals or ethics. Those are very different concepts. Uh, and I'd be happy over drinks tonight, if you would like, to talk a little more about that. But we don't have time here to go into the details about why law, on the one hand, and morals and ethics are so different. So my question, oh, before I get to the question, though, uh, I, do, I do need to say that, of course, this is based uh, on a big assumption, uh, the one raised yesterday by Dan, which is, I, this is based, based on the assumption that we actually have a choice in the matter, and that there isn't some extraterrestrial civilization out there that has already made these decisions for us. So the question is, assuming we are free to make the decisions about how and whether to apply our law to the extraterrestrials, there are a couple of points. So the starting point of any question in our society about this is our Constitution, which gives us absolutely, or not us, gives extraterrestrials absolutely no hope at all, because it only gives rights to persons. No person shall be denied life, liberty, or property without due process. No person. And I can assure you, there is no chance that the word person will ever be interpreted any broader than a human being. It's not going to happen. A corporation now, going to do that. And a group of humans. <laughs> and <embryos>. Nope. <laughs> we'll get to that later. <laughs> <laughs> Deciding, and what is the law? Who is we? Is it a load of white guys who are in Western society? No. And whose law is this? Is this law of some Undumbuku tribe in Brazil? No, well, that was, well, that's a good question, and I was giving you my next point, yeah. which is uh, not only uh, does our Constitution not protect anything other than persons, but it only it doesn't have any extraterritorial effect. It only applies in the United States. So we can't make law for the rest of the world. We just don't do that. And when you say, who is we, we is our, well, first of all, when it comes to the Constitution, we is, in fact, the people, because the Constitution can only be amended by the people. Uh, but to, to continue, the so there, there are, however, 50 state constitutions. And the states have much more flexibility and willingness to consider uh, a broader definition of person or even protect non-persons. But, of course, if they do, uh, whatever they do only applies in that state. So, you know, maybe, maybe if ET, ET wants to come here, you know, and they want protection, they might want to land, say, in Berkeley, which is probably <laughs> maybe the greatest chance they'd have to, to, be, to be protected. Okay, so that's the Constitution. The second, the second uh, source of rights for uh, all of us, including, and extraterrestrials, should we want to give them rights, are our laws, which are passed by Congress. Now, the laws we have actually may have some effect on extraterrestrials, I'm, I'm not sure. I mean, just for example, 
we have immigration laws, right? And there are laws that prohibit, uh, that limit who can enter our country. Um, so, you know, like take those creatures in arrival, they were here illegally, right? <laughs> <laughs> they could have been deported. Um, so, so that's one set of laws. We also have laws, federal laws, that protect endangered species. Um, now, it turns out that I don't think the definition of endangered species would cover an extraterrestrial, but that doesn't mean Congress couldn't change it <coughs> protection to them. And of course, we have uh, laws and regulations that, uh, uh, that control pathogens. And, you know, maybe an extraterrestrial is a pathogen uh, it, 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 with respect to humanity. So, so we do have lots of laws that now could affect uh, extraterrestrials, and if if our society wants to think about <coughs> extending the law to extraterrestrials, whatever <coughs> they are, we can think about doing it through legislation, federal or state. The third area uh, is federal uh, regulations, especially uh, and executive orders, especially of uh, agencies like the National Science Foundation and NASA. Now, those regulations could well articulate rights uh, and responsibilities for alien intelligence. Uh, now, generally, it would only apply to, uh, to aliens who are either here or discovered uh, by federal agencies like NASA. It wouldn't, uh, although we can talk about this, Cassie, later, it wouldn't, it's a little more difficult to. To, to get to uh, aliens brought here or discovered by Elon Musk. Um, but nevertheless, that's an area where you might, where we as a society might want to think about whether and to what extent to apply the law to aliens. The third, the, four, the final area is the common law, which is, you know, judge-made law, um, courts. That's, uh, and now the federal courts, like the ones I serve on, we don't do very much common law. Or, but the state courts do. The interesting thing about this, it's in the state courts where there's been some interesting uh, litigation about the rights of animals. Um, um, and and, and a, 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 about the rights of animals, like for example, uh, chimpanzees uh, and other animals who are, uh, who are used in, in research. And state, state courts have a great deal of flexibility in terms of interpreting their laws, but once again, Whatever they do would only apply in that state. So that's that's the that's the universe for thinking about this issue from the from the perspective of our country. If you want to go internationally or globally, there's really only two uh, in terms of mandatory requirements. That is, legal rights or legal obligations. If you want to go internationally, there's really only two options for that. One is treaties. And the United States can sign, negotiate treaties with other countries, which could include, I gather from the or do, um, <clears throat> the, uh, or could uh, the protection or uh, responsibilities of extraterrestrials. Uh, and then, of course, there's the United Nations, which um, is uh, uh, the, uh, anything that would be done through the United Nations would most likely not be in for any rights or obligations developed through UN procedures would probably not be enforceable in the United States unless they're incorporated by the law in the United States. So that's the framework within which uh, if one wanted to think about the rights and, and responsibilities of extraterrestrial uh, extraterrestrial life, and I use the word life, not extraterrestrial intelligence, to, bro to define it as broadly as possible, so that it covers everything from intelligent life to microbial life. But that's the framework within which a society like ours, which is based on the rule of law, would make these decisions. Is there one, one provocative yes. question? Yeah, surely this is a global issue and not a, an American issue. And America's history of, let's say, international uh, signing international agreements, such as it doesn't even recognize the call of the Hague, which is beyond me, if, if 
Correct me if I'm wrong, but I'm pretty sure that's the case. No, right. There's many United Nations things it has not signed up to. So is this a, an American problem or is this a global problem? Uh, Problems are wrong, but this is a global no, you're, thing. You're totally right. It's obviously a global problem, but we can only start here. I mean, uh, I was describing our legal system for dealing with this. It has its limitations, but that's the system we have. If we want to make it global, it's got to be done through treaties or through the United Nations. That's, that has been done, so I'll cover that. Yeah. Okay, now, if you have a question, please wait and... Can, can we text it to you? <laughs> no. <laughs> How are you going to text it to me? No, but it, 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 I want to get through all of this, and I anticipate a lively discussion. I really do. So the next question, question number two, is Cassie's question that I rephrased and made shorter. So, uh, Cassie? So this is just a, I, mean, it, I wasn't at the time sure which set of things would be happening first uh, in terms of my talk and, and program carefully enough. But I introduced this in the talk that I just recently gave. The question is how important is it to identify and or protect extraterrestrial life that might be in its own native habitat? or after it's brought to Earth, if we do bring it to Earth. And that's a, actually, I would prefer to flip the two questions around because I think, may I do that? May I flip for question four with question two? Do whatever you wish. Okay, so I'm gonna flip <laughs> question four and question two because question four directly addresses, should, okay. follows appropriately after question oh, Okay, do question so four. Question four is, should we bring samples of extraterrestrial material back to Earth, even if we don't know whether they have extraterrestrial life? And this is actually covered in Article 9 of the Outer Space Treaty that was signed in 1967, ratified by the Senate of the United States and the Soviet Union, High Soviet, in less than six months after it was approved by the UN. It is a UN treaty. It, over 120-something countries have signed it, or over 100, I think it's 120 something. Article 9 of that treaty was the one I quoted on my slide earlier. States party to the treaty shall explore extraterrestrial objects so as to avoid harmful contamination of those objects. What harmful contamination is, is not defined in the treaty language. And also avoid adverse changes to the environment of the Earth resulting from the introduction of extraterrestrial matter. So there is a treaty that covers this <coughs> question. In Article 6 of the treaty, it says that treaty um, States party to the treaty shall exercise uh, authorization and continuing supervision of entities. There is also another Article 6 or another article that says that states party to the treaty are liable, liable for the actions of non-governmental entities. So whether, if you have to take it to the Hague and the US doesn't recognize the Hague, that become, makes the liability question a little bit of an issue. But there is a international legal framework that addresses the return of the exploration of other planets and the return of extraterrestrial matter, specifically in the context of causing adverse changes to the environment of the Earth. The International Council for Science has, from the 1960s, sponsored guidelines that identify replicating entities, biohazard, bio, biological organisms from somewhere else, extraterrestrial life, as being the main target that could cause adverse changes. Nuclear materials, any kind of poison, going to be a limited amount being brought back. So something that replicates is really the thing that would cause potentially adverse changes to the environment of the Earth. So this question was um, more in the context of, it was the, the legal framework exists. In the US, we also have presidential directive, national security action memo, or national security NSC, national, national security circular number 25 which addresses large-scale scientific experiments that have large-scale environmental consequences. That mandates that the agency, federal agency, doing the experiment has to consult with the State Department, the National Academy of Sciences State Department, if it has potentially effects beyond the US borders introduction of a replicating entity would potentially do that. So there is a legal framework. The reason that I wanted this question up here is, is more the even if we do not know whether they contain native life. I presented the slide illustrating that contamination can affect, interfere with the interpretation of signals. We had the radio uh, example as well. And the question is how much uncertainty from an ethical standpoint um, as well as a legal standpoint. There's a legal framework that the House of Representatives has said is 
should not be considered the obligations of the U.S. Or may not be considered. Um, which is that guideline is a ten to the sixth probability of releasing something that could the material that comes back into the Earth's environment. That is one guideline. It, the U.S. apparently doesn't want to follow that guideline. So what level of risk? How do we address? What kind of things, what level of risk is acceptable? Do we use a legal framework? Do we use an ethical framework? Do we ignore it altogether because the short-term benefit of having corporate exploration of space is so much more important than any of these longer-term questions? That's the question that I'm trying to get to. OK. There's one person asking. Yes. Go ahead. But I'm sorry. Contrary Science's Decadal Survey, Vision of Voyages, 2013, large missions. First sentence, the highest priority large mission for the decade, 20, decade 2013 to 2022 is the Mars Astrobiology Explorer Cache, which will begin the three mission NASA ESA Mars sample return campaign. Yep. The science community has stated the highest science priority for planetary science is bringing stuff back. And that so mission. Playing, so wait, playing the small town Iowa farm boy guy, it's like, all this legal stuff is nice. The science demands we bring it back. And there is a perfectly compliant, a mechanism in the guidelines that is perfectly capable of complying with that approach. So we're all good. <laughs> the, 2020 project, the 2020 project is doing something different. Wait, 2020 is just like caching samples. Right, but there's an Actually, obligation. Actually, caching samples without promising yeah. But there is an obligation to maintain cleanliness of the samples so that you can figure out whether there's extraterrestrial life, as opposed to Earth life, in the samples. And there's going to be quite a lot of contamination. Uh, yeah. Um, uh, that one question, and then we're going to open it up at the end for everybody to argue as much as they wish. And I, that particular issue, especially on March 2020. Some of you may not know it, but it is a really hot button issue from an engineering standpoint, and from a stand science standpoint, and from an ethical, moral, legal standpoint. Could you explain the issue just slightly uh, more? So I, I will refer to something that Andrew Steele has said about the Allen Hills meteorite. He did, was able to demonstrate by going to Svalbard and collecting lava from freshly exploded and, and, fresh volcanic eruptions, that all of the indications that were made claimed as being indicators of life in the Ellen Hills meteorite, other people worked on this also. I'm just I'm working with Steely, which is why I'm mentioning him. All of those indications were consistent with having been produced by processes that had nothing to do with biology. So the little globules, you find them in lava. The major challenge that he found in demonstrating that and in looking for biosignatures or biological or orbit, organic compounds that could be indicative of biology in the Allen Hills meteorite and other meteorites is that they're contaminated with Earth stuff. Even if you go back to some of the chert that um, Bill Schopf looked at for very early fossils, there's a root running through the rock. So you have to ignore all the recent biology to try to get at the old potential biology. And a lot of that recent biology will eat the evidence of the old stuff. So if you want to understand what was there in the sample, it's really important not to have contamination because it alters the material. Absolutely. Do you wish to go back to question number two? Oh, wait till my turn again. Well, you can have your turn again. I mean, uh, we'll go okay, No, no, go through the other people. Okay, then I'm going to go back. I'm going to go back to three because three is mine. <laughs> okay. Yes. Uh, and so the question is: Do or should we change our protection exploitation criteria based on single cell versus multicellular versus intelligence? And I drew this question after I I listened to Catherine's talk. I wanted to bring this out as a discussion. Because, in particular, I think and I want to phrase this properly, so I actually uh, sort of made a note to myself. We do not know, we really don't know the value of a microbial world off Earth. Okay, so these microbes could give rise to an intelligent or technological advanced life form as occurred here on Earth. Now, if we don't think that they have 
any value, any intrinsic value, we could thwart the evolution of actually an advanced civilization. For example, if someone had come here and actually said, oh, we're just a world of slime, who cares? What do we do? We exploit it for ourselves. We have thwarted and stopped the evolution of a technology, of a civilization, of what we have here today. And with that, that is, that is why I threw that particular question out there, because if we look at a microbial world, it's not necessarily going to remain a microbial world in perpetuity. It will evolve. And I'm not necessarily saying that it's just exactly like Earth, but I'm saying that if it is a life form, an ecosystem, and a biosphere, they will evolve. So that is why I threw that particular question up there. That we can't always think of microbes as just microbes on another world. Any comment? Yes. Oh, someone else had the comments. Uh, okay, Jason. So what that makes me think of is the moral standard of future generations, which strikes me as a moral, as a, a thorny problem, because economics tells us that if you try to do discounting for future generations, then you should sacrifice everything for the future. And so, um, and we don't do that, and, and that would also be a framework I don't feel like we've developed here. That's just what it made me think of. It's not a question, I'm sorry. That's all right. But I threw that out there because it is a thorny problem. But it's something that we really, I think, in the long run, have to at least think about. Okay? If it's short. It's short. The philosopher whose who's, um, body of thought uh, applies most closely to this question is Gene Roddenberry. <laughs> the, uh, the prime directive the prime is you're not supposed to influence cultural evolution, but if we follow the logic you've said, then, then slime is cultural evolution, so we should just leave it all alone. Okay, that, that, I'm going to cut that off until the very end. Do you want to go back to number two? Yes, exactly, because number two follows very nicely on this, which is depending on what you've decided about the relative value of small organisms versus medium-sized organisms versus intelligent organisms, then another question is, where are those organisms located? And how are you interacting with them? If you're just looking at them and sending signals to them, that's very different than if you have found them on a planet that you can access, versus if you then go and slurp them up as a vacuum cleaner and depressurize them back on Earth, uh, to allude to a previous example. So there is, it's not just the type of organisms that you're looking at, it's also the way that you're interacting or observing them and what you do with them when you encounter them. And again, it's, there will be different opinions. I mean, there are different <coughs> levels of value that can be placed on, the, on different situations. But if a hostile, intelligent, extraterrestrial life form comes here, I suspect we're going to do the same thing they did in War of the Worlds and try to fight back rather than let them overtake us. So there's different scenarios will result in different conclusions about how to handle this problem. For this question. Yes. Yeah, Jim. you know my uh, comment. I don't believe this business about protecting microbes because a billion years from now they may evolve intelligent beings. But I think if we found microbes on Mars, we'd want to protect them because the biologists would want to study them and understand what, how that life form existed and, and uh, worked. So I think it would be absolutely fascinating question for science, I'm not sure it's that much of a moral issue. Well, actually, and following up on that, if I may, yes, you may. another question, you really want to know whether they're related to us or not. Because if they have DNA, that means they can eat DNA. <laughs> well, exactly. So, so we should study them. We should protect them because we want to study them. And we would do that for quite a long time. Yes. I'd like to move on to the next question, which is question number five, which also happens to be Cassie's question. Ah, so, and this then gets back to the converse of what I just mentioned. If we find extraterrestrial life, it, if it's related to us, it's actually more likely to be hazardous to us than if it's totally unrelated to us. But we know that Earth life can be problematic. And so bringing Earth organisms of various other sorts with us when, we, when humans go to explore other places, not to mention our spacecraft, which we've already done, um, there is 
I alluded to this in my talk earlier, there's this perception on the part of people who engage in developing space exploration practice. They are not biologists. They apparently never get infections. I have one on my finger right here, so it's a problem. <laughs> 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 that I think, sorry, I was thinking about whether I would do that or not. I really do. I close the window on my finger and it's <laughs> infected and I need some antibiotics. But the problem is that Earth organisms are problems. They can really cause issues with how we explore. Rare films on the space station, well, the reason the bathroom went out some years ago was because there were too many biofilms in the, the hose line. So it causes really unpleasant problems for people. And yet, there's this perception on the part of people who want to engage in space explorations of how we've solved all the problems about Earth life. So how do we address this challenge? Obviously, during Earth, earlier exploration is going to be different than later on when people want to colonize if they ever get that far. Um, yeah, Go you, ahead. you were asking. Yes, sorry, I was pointing oh, to you to make sure they So I guess I'm wondering, um, it, it seems that protection only seems to be brought up in the context of the search for life, but I mean, aren't there good reasons that the pursue protection policies for other scientific disciplines? And that is the point of this, yeah. yeah. And, and non-scientific issues. I don't want to get infected if I'm going to go to the So I mean, what, do you have any sense of why it is that astrobiology seems to have ownership over this protection question, and why there haven't been more serious considerations given to policies for like wider geology. environmental protection in space? Mm -hmm. So Charlie Cuckell actually does have the planetary parks concept. But I, I think it's partly a selection bias in that a lot of the people who work on exploring space are really gung-ho about exploring space. Very few of them have a substantial expertise in epidemiology or biosecurity or some of these issues that are much more related to how much damage Earth can do. And so let, it's a... Let, yeah. let's, let's wait on that because yeah. I, there are a lot of touchy issues here as well. But I am going to say something. I'm going to invoke my, uh, my right as the uh, head of the panel, in that, uh, which is a little taking aback here, in spite of what I said earlier on my question, I am a practicing microbiologist. What that means is I kill billions and billions and billions of microbes all the time. I mean, and every microbiologist does. So let's just want to put that out to keep everything in perspective. <laughs> okay. Okay. So um, moving on, moving on, I Let's go to Kelly on question six. <clears throat> okay, so my question is, uh, was Carl Sagan right when he said, if there's life on Mars, I believe that we should do nothing with Mars. Mars then belongs to the Martians, even if the Martians are only microbes. Um, I had a paper on this, if anybody was interested, but I actually argue that this, as well as the Prime Directive, David, is an excellent example of an ethical principle that sounds really good if you don't think about it very hard. It's actually immoral. And the argument is actually pretty simple. I, I, I said there was a difference between law on the one hand and ethics and morality on the other. Yeah, I'm not, not saying anything about the law. And morality. I'm just I'm saying it's immoral. <laughs> Whether that's legal, I don't know. That, that's up to you. <laughs> well, I think the argument is fairly simple. If we forego the use of Mars in perpetuity, that will impose a massive opportunity cost on humanity. Now we can argue how much, but a massive cost. Humans clearly have moral value. That fact seems to be lost sometimes in these conversations, but humans have moral value, a very high moral value. Microbes might have moral value, but if they do, it's significantly less than humans. So to argue that we should leave Mars alone and let the microbes do their thing, I think is just patently immoral. We don't even know if Martians are human. I wonder if moving to Mars is the morally correct solution for humans, though. I and mean, we came up earlier in the talks, I forget who exactly mentioned it, but the idea that uh, perhaps the best future morally and ethically for humans and sustainably is a sustainable future, right? With managing population rather than expanding infinitely, um, which eventually will be a non-sustainable solution. So uh, perhaps that's not the correct way to think about it. Well, just to be maximally curmudgeonly, I actually disagree that a sustainable future is necessarily the best way to go, but set all that aside. I mean, the nice thing about Sagan's statement is it's absolute. I don't have to argue for any particular use of Mars. I just have to say, gosh, it looks like it's going to be quite useful for something sometime. That's all I got to say. And then the argument works. Sure. Okay. But 
Yeah. Next. If I may. Uh, okay, it's sure. It's a counter argument, so you're mentioning <laughs> the opportunity cost. But the opportunity cost can actually be calculated to some degree, and then if it might be useful for something, sometimes it's something that we cannot calculate, but we can calculate the, some of the damages, right, that can be done. So it's like uncertainty versus something that we can actually quantify an opportunity cost. So we should base our decisions on that. Not if we know for a fact that we can't calculate future opportunity costs accurately. Then you have a systematic bias. Well, there are probabilities, so accuracy is based on probability, so it can be a probability of X percent. I would be happy to engage in that analysis with you, and I think I'm going to win. <laughs> <laughs> Don't be so sure. <laughs> All right, the last, the last question before we get to the general discussion is also a count. Okay, so this is a question that says, who should make the decision about how to do things in space science which have significant ethical dimensions? And, and you guys might be thinking, yeah, let's make sure the scientists have enough say in that, which is one way of thinking about it. But I'm also a little bit concerned about that because one of the dynamics I've seen sometimes when I talk to scientific audiences, not just you guys, but other audiences, is that scientists have a tendency to think that they're super smart. We are. I know. I'm not saying Space science. If you ask a bunch of space scientists, you have got a group of people who think that space is way more interesting than the average person. And that is clearly a relevant bias. So there needs to be some mechanism by which the public can weigh in and space science actually listens to them, even if you don't like their answer. Maybe the public says that commercialization of space is an awesome idea. You can't go, Oh, stupid people, we will not do that. You have to allow them to weigh in and then actually take them seriously. See, let me just say, I, I, think, I don't think you're saying this wrong. It's not that the public has to have an opportunity to weigh in. It's ultimately a decision for the public in our system. Yeah. For two reasons. I mean, for two reasons. One is, it's almost all funded by the public. And yes, Scientists are smarter than the public, and scientists should make the recommendations, but it's ultimately the public through its legislature that has to make that decision. Also, these decisions have enormous, beyond the question of funding, these decisions have enormous consequences for the public, which is the second reason why these decisions have to be made by the public. How the public makes it is the little outline I gave you. But, you know, ever since since post the end of World War II, we've had this quite wonderful system that I worry is breaking down, where uh, this wonderful relationship, you know, originally developed by the wish of the relationship between government and science, and how the government relies on scientists for scientific judgments, but the ultimate decisions are made by the government. And that's worked pretty well up until the past uh, two and a half years. Yeah. But, but there is a very specific, there is a very specific way in which that fails, which is that long-term consequences are very much less receive very much less attention <coughs> than near-term benefits, and to some extent near-term losses. But near-term benefits outweigh long-term losses in a big way, to the extent that in Japan they now have a set of people who are responsible for representing future generations in these kinds of discussions, specifically because we are so bad at acknowledging our obligations to the future, because there's more of them than there are of us, for no other reason. Okay. It's, it needs to be addressed in a different way than we have been. Okay, with that, uh, I hope everybody is anticipating and held back really key questions, because I'm going to open it up for everything. So, go ahead. So, I actually have a question that's not on there, but I think it's related to all of them. And I think the thing that worries me most about all of this discussion, given human nature, it, especially with the dramatic differentiation in um, the, the wealth, the wealth separation that's happened in the world, is the actions of the rogue operator. And what I worry about right now, hugely, 
is that we have no way, literally no way, of controlling the rogue operator or punishing them if they operate in a rogue way. And, and I think the Outer Space Treaty, tr truthfully, I think has zero enforcement right, right now. I think, I think we will discard it in this briefest drop of the hat if, if it will benefit us in some way. And I would love to hear your opinions on that. So, if I may, there is a way to regulate a role. So, the way to regulate world operators, there is a bottleneck in space exploration that's really, really obvious. You have to get off this planet. And every country has a launch, launch authorization process. So, any rogue operator who's actually going to get anywhere has to go through a country's launch, authoriza uh, launch authorization process. That's really where it's breaking down. And the country that's breaking it down is the US. Hey, because it's seen as an economic opportunity. Correct. Short term. I was just, just going to say, and, and this follows directly on, on to what you were saying, you, you could um, do uh, question 7A, which is a change should to will. Who will make the decisions yeah. how to do things in space? And to what extent does what we think enter into that at all? And, it, and we, we were whispering before, why isn't somebody from SpaceX here? Um, <laughs> Because um, I, both because I, I want them to hear what you guys have to say, but also I want to hear what they have to say because those are the people maybe that are going to be, um, whether we like it or not, making some of these decisions. Yes. Uh, suppose for the sake of argument that uh, it could be conclusively demonstrated that Mars uh, is being contaminated with live Earth microbes uh, naturally by conspermia in quantities that dwarf uh, human contamination. Uh, would that make question five moot? Do you keep brushing your teeth and take any work? Well, uh, so in quantities that dwarf, uh, you know. But they're not the ones that are associated with humans and therefore not likely yeah. to be the ones no, that are Well, uh, but what, 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 if, what if it can be done? I guess my question yeah. was. So like, anything that happens well, naturally does not alleviate the problem of bringing nasty stuff with us when we go. You always want to be careful of that, regardless of what's happening. <laughs> Even wait, 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 why is the stuff Air that is on a spacecraft more nasty than the stuff that occurs no. naturally? Because it's in, because Jardia is unlikely to get there naturally. If there are pathogens associated with the humans, why would you let them go, regardless of what's going on naturally? That's an additional dose that you're providing when you put your spacecraft in. Yeah. I mean, it's the same reason that quarantine happens. It's why you wash your feet when you're crossing borders in South America, because you don't want foot and mouth disease to transmit. Humans historically have brought nasty stuff with us when we don't pay attention. When we do pay attention, we can reduce the amount that gets transferred. It's not perfect, but would you rather have something or free free ride? I don't know, free reign for no control still. Catherine. Thank you. Um, so to the subject of rogue operators, or we could call them unilateral actors, and to the you know the the issue of the bottleneck, which sometimes will work and sometimes won't in practice, right? And also to the issue of rule of law that may simply fail and that somebody will decide to, to you know, breach code and then pay the fine. <laughs> we're seeing examples of this in space, certainly with uh, launches of satellites that were, out, in fact, not, impro not approved and, you know, you get whacked with a million dollar fine, big deal. <laughs> it's worth it in terms of the profits. So, I mean, there's no question um, as, as well, you know, that, you know, this entire situation is very vulnerable to unilateral actors. I would say, though, okay, well, Instead of just kind of screaming about that, that many of us want to, want to do, it's like, well, okay, let's recognize that that's the reality and see how we work with that. So one of the things you do have is persuasion. So you can say, you know, look, there's this huge council of scientists, for example, and other interested citizens that say, we would really, really like it if you don't do this. And if you do do this, we will be so mad. That actually goes some distance, believe it or not. And it may, in fact, be more effective than you know, some kind of sets of laws. The other thing you can do is recognize, OK, we're into this new era, which is really awkward, somewhat unprecedented, and what are we going to do? There have been some really smart suggestions. For example, extend processes that corporations already recognize from Earth, such as environmental assessments. So let's say you decide you have your plants for your Mars colony, force them to go through an environmental assessment process, just like we have on Earth. Um, you now, it does get into these awkward situations where, you know, because life shouldn't exist on Mars, let's take Mars as an example, I mean, it exists in a place. And of course, under the Outer Space Treaty, there's all these issues about territory, right? Um, so how do you separate issues of the life from the issues of the place and, and appropriation of territory and all of these awkward things? But I think there may be a mechanism. Um, 
if we kind of let go of what is probably not going to work as well as we would like it to and introduce something new that works within structures that were, are already recognizable, there may be some additional ways forward. Um, in addition, as I say, to the, you know, the soft persuasion aspects. Just a thought. Anybody want to comment on that? Yeah, this is a direct response, though, and in response to also what Cassie said. I mean, what if the rogue operator is the U.S.? Oh, I mean, yeah. I'm Canadian, our... believe me. <laughs> <laughs> Hearing you loud and clear. <laughs> I mean, I mean if, if our administrations in the future, let's not just yeah. blame this one, if our administrations in the future decide that corporations and the, and the short-term profit are important, like I said, I think we're going to drop the Outer Space Treaty like a hot potato, yes. and we're going to do whatever we want. And how, how do you... How do you dissuade that one? I think there's broad support in the country probably for that. Truthfully, at, truthfully, I really think oh, there is. Yeah, and yeah. there's dollars to be made. Sure, I know. I so, mean, we have an example of that with Starlink right now, right? Like, astronomers did not like the idea of Starlink, and everybody was like, free internet for everyone, yay! And astronomers were like, put the science. <laughs> so, I mean, I mean and a, a big bunch of scientists can get together and say, we don't like this, but if there's profit, this be, be fair, like, well, be fair. To be fair, there are international regulations and Starlink has worked with the radio astronomy community, off the optical, radio astronomy community in terms of radio, radio frequency interference. But we don't like it. We don't like it. We don't like the treaty. We lose it up. Well, if, if radio astronomers had their way, we'd like have the entire spectrum. <laughs> Somebody in the back there who so I don't want to neglect. What does that agreement say about what fraction of the Starlink satellites should not break into oscillation? And if one does, then what is the remedy? Yeah, that's an SOL. That's, you know, we're SOL. Yeah, they have a problem saying that. If, if something breaks down in space, there's nobody to send the, you know, with the screwdriver to fix it. So I want to come back to the question of sample return. Um, yeah, we should be very cautious about bringing samples back to Earth, but I'm obviously an advocate of sample return. So um, I just wanted to bring into the question about how we actually manage sample return. So right now we have in place samples from the moon, samples from comets, asteroids. Um, they go all into curation, they're very controlled, but you apply for some of these samples as a scientist to take back to your own laboratory to do your own analysis. You um, claim what you're going to do to that sample, how it's going to be used, and how it is going, if or if not it's destroyed. If it's not, you return it back, and if it is, then what that waste product may or may not be. That may or may not be in a full cellular structure. But we do this a lot with biology, and this is where I'd like to hear the biologist's perspective on this. Um, we go to the field and we collect samples from unique places, we bring them back to our laboratory, we analyze them, we interpret them, but what do you do after that? What's the return on that? It can still cause contamination issues within your local environment if you're not cautious. You and if you're like not autoclaving? Right. Right. But if you are not actually filling out and getting the appropriate approvals, you will be not permitted to publish, as well as potentially get in some legal trouble That's if you correct. cross state lines or national lines right. without the appropriate print. So I'm just there saying is, there's, there's there's a way to, to, to you know right. so release these things. With with Mars sample return, there has actually been an extensive amount of work amongst the international Mars community figuring out exactly how to deal with this problem of <laughs> containment and appropriate levels of life detection and risk assessment. So there have been multiple studies. So I'm confused. I, I, I just want like, to hear from the biologists. I'd just like to, put this, I'd like to put this in perspective with regard to Mars sample return. <clears throat> and everybody is really, uh, I mean, I, I'm sort of on a workshop with regard to Mars sample return. And everybody is really concerned about bringing back something that is really deadly. But I think we all have to realize that we already have things here that are extraordinarily deadly. Right. That if they get out of containment, you're dead. And there's no way we can fix it. Right. So we have the ability to actually handle those kinds of things without being panicked. I just wanted to make sure everybody knew that yeah. and we throw that out there. But that, that's more my question is what if we don't know the level of insecurity that we have with a sample. So you bring back a rock from an asteroid you may not think has any biological potential, 
Um, you do your same analysis, say it's infrared spectroscopy. Um, you crush the sample, you mix it with some salt, you put it into your spectrometer, you measure a spectrum. Um, and then that waste is disposed of in regular chemical regulations of your local institution. So that, that's because the mission that went and collected the sample from the asteroid already did the work to demonstrate that it was a, not a biohazard. Okay. So there's, there is a framework that is followed by currently all. There's a protocol out there to yeah. actually No, the international guidelines that I referenced, I didn't go through them, but that all, all of those scenarios are there. All the international guidelines. Okay. Yes, so, Lynn. Say it's, it's touching how people have this idea that a single microbe is going to take over the Earth. I've got students who could kill yeast. I've got students who could kill E. coli. Um, it's not, you know, they're all not likely to do it. But what I, my, more, my point was getting back to um, number three and then a springboard to the whole discussion is that we seem to talk so much about this dichotomy between microbes and intelligence. And I remind people that Barry Blumberg at least told me that he believed viruses were intelligent. But no one has mentioned pain and suffering as a criterion. It's all intelligence or not, and I would put out there that maybe we should be considering that as well. If, if we're dealing with creatures that, that are going to suffer pain and suffering, and they're not classically intelligent, we still should be putting them in some sort of category of care. That's almost a softball. Okay? Anybody want to comment on that? Yes. <laughs> With respect to number six, was was Sagan right? Um, if there if 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 there are even just microbes, then Mar does Mars belong to the Martians? Um, in the answer, you spoke of how uh, humans are worth more than microbes, and um, I mean that that's an interesting statement. But not not to assess that statement directly. I mean, you may, maybe maybe you're right, but I also hear any. Uh, I hear not just you, but multiple people seeming to equate the value of Earth microbes with Martian microbes. And you talk about how you're killing microbes all the time just for perspective. And in fact, once I heard Bob Zubrin say, well, if there's microbial life on Mars, it's just going to be our key. your hand up a while and haven't asked a question. Go ahead. Sure. So this is about, my question is about uh, number six as well. Uh, so I'm interested in this position. You know, Mars has, let's say Mars has microbes, therefore we should leave it alone in case it evolves into something more intelligent or because it's valuable on its own. I'm interested in the next logical step from that. If Mars had organics on its surface and liquid water and <laughs> microbes were the next step, would, should we therefore leave Mars alone because microbes might develop and therefore intelligent life might? Like, how far do we have to take that analogy back? Is microbes the like bright line in the sand or is like water and organics already like, you know, we're thinking about going to Titan, it's been selected. Like, that seems like the next step on that moral journey of where do we stop? And I'm interested to hear people who would defend that position, how they feel about the position of we shouldn't go to planets with water and organics. I can give you my position, but uh, my position is that there's a big difference between the two. Because even here on Earth, there, we know that there's a big difference between going from uh, primordial soup that we think can give rise to life, or probably did give rise to life and actually having that life. So that's just my personal opinion. Somebody else have an opinion on that? I mean, there's all sorts of life we could create by doing or not doing a given action. There's just sort of no accounting for so much of that. What I worry about here is that, and I think this is a way Kelly can sometimes advocate for his positions, is by drawing this contrast <coughs> with the view that Sagan says that, that I think a lot of people would rightly regard as a very extreme view. But projecting that view doesn't have to get us all the way to peer anthropocentrism. Right? Yeah. There are all sorts of shades that we can recognize in between. And of course, that's what I was trying to advocate for in my talk earlier, but I'll be quiet. Uh, Jason. So, I, and I was going to ask something similar, but, but I think Jesse articulated it better, which is that what if there is no life on Mars? Does it have any moral standing in that case? And I can think of a lot of dimensions in which it can. I mean, we know that people have, you know, uh, they put a value on unspoiled wilderness, and not just because there are trees there or something like that, but because there's value in leaving resources untouched, if only for future generations, or just to know that it's there. People who never visit national parks support there being national parks that they will never see. And so I'd like to extend it even farther. What if there are no organics and there's never been water? Is there any moral or ethical or legal framework for leaving it alone and not mining the hell out of it or whatever, and not leaving it there? 
in that case. But I'm really interested in everyone's opinion on funk. I wrote a book about that. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Anyways. Uh, Dan. Um, so I think Martian microbes, if they're an independent biogenesis, are worth about 100 billion euros in, 19, in 2019 euro. But cool. so I wonder if there's some compromise where you could have uh, robots crawling around on Mars and maybe have some economic value to that that would benefit humans and life here on this planet. But could you also uh, not wipe out the Martian microbes? Because I think they are intrinsically valued to us and to them. I wonder if there's a way to do both. So those, those are they, what answer uh, and maybe it's, maybe you don't put humans there, but maybe robots that might be okay. That is exactly the mechanism that was proposed for human, early human exploration, as well as in conjunction with that, Charlie Capel being one person who proposed this, a set of planetary parts. So you identify certain locations that you are willing to allow to become more contaminated. Even there, you could send humans to one part. You send the robots to the places you want to keep cleaner. Preferably, keep the humans in space. And yeah. By analogy of those, so then you get kind of the best of both there. worlds. Right, and you do this as a process. And well, you learn something, then you decide what to do next. You learn some more, and you decide what to do next. And that allows you to judge how dare are the are the Mars microbes? Are they related to us or not? But let's be clear. You, okay. you might get the best of both. It depends on what you want to do with Mars. You're not going to be able to do everything you want to do. No. With Mars. Yeah, I'm, I'm advocating. We just. We do a minor little things where we're not killing a lot of Martian so you, microbes because I think they're restricting valuable. the opportunity cost. Yeah, so it's still exactly. there. It's so, still there. But there's right. value. There's and value. Yeah, I'm saying, saying you have to, you have to weigh the two values. You I have to say, I'm well, saying okay. they're worth a hundred billion euros in, <laughs> in 2019. But it has two values. It's you do oh, yeah. you make one step and then you reassess and you take another step and you reassess. That's how things were proposed yeah. in the 1990s. And it might, my evaluation might be wrong. It might be trillions. It might be worth less. But we yeah, learn as we go. But we make a mistake if we just wipe them all out. But you know that factor is what we're in, and I've got another one here. I'm going to follow up on Jason's point. I want to follow up on Jason's point. This morning we would talk, and we have continued to talk about microbes. Do the microbes on Mars have intrinsic value that justifies or requires their preservation, or is it only their value to humanity to study? Right? That's the question. So Jason pushed me on that at lunch today, and we, we were discussing the question, well, what about, our, what about our national parks? Did we create national parks here? Are national parks created for the benefit of humans or because the wilderness has some intrinsic value beyond their value to humans? So Jason, I did a little research today. And there's actually not a clear answer. <laughs> I'm sure there'd be surprised. When Yellowstone was created in um, 1872, it, this, the law says it is created, quote, for the benefit and enjoyment of the people. So Yellowstone was not created because the wilderness had some intrinsic value. But, but then it gets more complicated. When the National Park Service was created in 1926, it was much broader. The fundamental purpose is to conserve and preserve and to provide for the enjoyment of future generations. So it's more complex. It's got both in there. My point is, is that it doesn't look like, it looks like, to the extent we've thought it through, I mean we, Americans, over the past 150 years, we have viewed preserving wilderness in our country as preserving it for the enjoyment of people. But I would say that enjoyment also comes, as was mentioned, from knowing it's there and never using it. Sure. Well, well that's, that's your thing. Being, that's not what no, the no, that's is. No. I think yeah. that was the proposal from Muir and Thoreau yeah. and all of this. I think that was well, part of the concept of enjoyment <laughs> as it was used okay. in that context. Okay, you know, I, I, I get, okay, Thoreau, right. You were asking me <laughs> why we created the national parks. And I was trying to give you an answer to that question. That's the judgment that people made when they created. That was the, it goes back to my point earlier. These ethical and moral debates are really intriguing and fascinating. But if you want, if you want to have them recognized in law, that is, if you want 
governmental decisions made on the basis of either in terms of setting aside parkland or providing funding for missions to Mars. They have to go through the process that I described at the outset. They have to somehow be accepted by the public and incorporated into law. Otherwise, we're just going to have these debates for the next 100 years, right? We won't get it. We're going to be debating this forever. The only way you get it done is to have, to have it incorporated one way or another into legal principles, whether they're laws or FAA regulations or NASA regulations. Somehow it has to get into, into the system and adopted one way or the other by the public. That's, yes, that's my have. point. So, so when I see question six, all I can think of is I, I bet that uh, Native Americans wish the Europeans had considered this question before they invaded North America. Um, and, and my guess is, is the same forces that drove the European invasion of the Americas will drive the answer to this question. So I, I find this discussion a little bit absurd in the sense that there are the other forces that are driving us. We have many historical examples of when this question was faced in other issues other than microbes on Mars that are going to make the decision for us. So there's still, even if that's true, I think there's still a value in having a clear conception of what you think should happen. And I, I also think, to, to echo what Catherine said, I think people tend to underestimate the amount of moral suasion they have. If some people stand up and say, no, I'm not going to do this, this is wrong, that can have an effect. It might not, but, but it's certainly going to have more of an effect than going, well, whatever. When the Europeans came in, the Indians were here, but a better analogy is when the Indians came in, and the, the, the so-called Native Americans, and there were already animals and microbes and plants yep. in the Americas, and, and they did they have any moral yeah. standing compared to the people showing up from Lapland? But to some degree, it was the same decision making. It, I think, right, but, but I'm trying to take it away of, from, of, from, from how the best to survive humans. and succeed. Yeah. Yeah. And, and that was one of my points in when I mentioned the International Geophysical Union. We tried to learn something. That was a different process. The discussions about climate production during the International Geophysical Year were a different process than humans had ever done before. That has lasted for 60 years. Now is when it might break. Yeah, yeah. Um, I mean, I, I don't want to uh, quote Steven Pinker, but I think there really is something to the argument. <laughs> <laughs> Nobody's <laughs> making you. <laughs> I think there really is something to the argument that historically uh, we have incorporated more and more moral issues into our legal system and our way of behaving. Yes. And you can just look at uh, what would now be considered absolutely unacceptable that was not even thought about a couple hundred years ago. It was not even on the table. And so I would like to ask David, yeah. because you say it's down at the kind of lower court levels where common law is bubbling up. Uh, how do you see the law going, in, uh, interacting with these issues? Well, let me go back to what you said, right? You are totally right. I mean, our Constitution is... It, is, uh, it, it incorporates moral and ethical judgments. That's what those are, right? I mean, um, uh, the, the, if you read the Bill of Rights, the principles that are set forth in the Bill of Rights, those are ethical and moral judgments that were built into our Constitution. That's how they became the law of the land. That's how that happened. Moral and ethical judgments emerging into legal principles. That's the way our system works. You ask about the, st the state courts. That's that's what happens with the common law. The common law are judge made, the de de judge made law. When the court issues an opinion. It is the law. And states do this much more. The federal courts we don't do that much of this anymore because so much of the work of the federal courts is interpreting legislation. That is congressional made law. But we still do. Actually, it's fun to do common law once in a while. Um, I actually like it. I wish it happened more often. But in the States, it happens all the time. So go back to this question of, uh, to, of, of, it, of what is a person? I mean, it's, it's, it's in the States where you have the most interesting debates in the courts about what persons are and what protections, in, uh, what, what protections animals and plants are deserving of in that state. And those, those decisions were made by the state courts interpreting 
their state laws and state constitutions. That's how it works. But they will be based. They will be. They will be. Uh, they will be ethical and moral judgments that get incorporated into the law through the legal process. That's the way it works. Yes. All right, so I'm a pragmatist who wants to be an idealist. And this, in, this entire discussion, I've just been coming back to the issue of this is, these, the answers to these questions are going to get answered by where the money is. And this has been touched on by intrinsic value versus opportunity cost, blah, 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 blah. So I, I'm also a data-centric person. So is there some study somewhere that first quantifies what intrinsic value actually is in different situations and analyzes what that quantification, or however many ways you want to do that, against opportunity cost for different uh, examples that we have in history? And I want to see that and what we can learn about the contact um, and all of these questions about extraterrestrial life, what we can learn from past human behavior. Because I think that is going to take us, answer a lot of these questions for us. So I was just wondering, like, from the economist, uh, economist side, are there any studies of opportunity costs versus, like, these kind of intrinsic value moral judgment calls? Yes. Go ahead. Talks. Okay, it's so called, what, what can we learn from supply that? and demand, mostly, so it's, it's the basic law of economics, right? So you pay for what you think the va that the value for that, of that good is, is to you, you know? So that's, that's like the basic law of economics. So there are tons of studies in that space. There are none of those studies in the astrobiology space, right? So that's where, again, economics came for a lot into, into this field. Um, and uh, to, uh, I want to touch a little bit, it is about money, so I want to touch a, bit, a little bit on the idea that, uh, yes, maybe it's the corporations who are going to decide and be there first. Uh, I live in Washington, D.C. Every other couple of blocks, <coughs> there is a lobbying firm, right? Because that's how policy is being, is being done. How do we counteract for that with the scientific community that needs to show studies, as Jason was pointing out, towards discounting for the future, how um, discounting for the larger macroeconomy, for the larger global economy, uh, show those studies how this is way how this way of shots the uh, you know the uh, um, uh, micro economies of the uh, uh, of the companies right that that want to go there so one example for instance is uh, with uh, climate change we woke up pretty late but now there is a lot of effort from the scientific community that has the power to persuade governments against lobbying firms um, so again, there are no studies from the scientific community in this space, in space studies or in astrobiology about uh, the economics of these efforts, but a larger scope, right? Discussing for the future global economies that are offshooting, you know, some of the personal profits that, that we are talking about. And it's very easy to translate. There have been so many studies, just, like, just have to take them and translate them into this space. And to give another example for how this can be done is the uh, maritime, uh, the maritime law, right? Uh, oceans were not um, owned by anybody. Uh, we have ocean pollution, right? Uh, right now, uh, but um, uh, there has been a long effort about um, how to regulate or how to understand uh, properties, property rights, or uh, maritime issues uh, where before there was it was just a wild land, right? So. So there are many lessons that we can learn from history, from the history of economics, and we should learn them and not repeat them, right? Because, right, yeah. But my, my point is, is that I think it would be valuable for data-centric people like me <laughs> to right. collate these, these examples and the lessons that we've learned from them and how they can apply to, to these questions. Completely agree. Data scientist economies, so yeah, completely yeah. agree. Yeah. Let, let me just point out an uncomfortable possibility that you guys are not going to like, right? We're all elites because we're like super smart and super sophisticated. <laughs> and we, we know what should happen with Mars or whatever, right? Cool but, as hell. Right. <laughs> but as, as David points out, ultimately, if you want to make a difference, it's going to have to be enshrined in law. And that is a democratic process. So the question is, can you convince enough people that you're right? Now, this is not scientists' forte, right? <laughs> That's ultimately the question. And, and at some point, if you can't convince enough people that you're right, 
you have to consider the possibility that maybe those people have good reasons for not wanting to go along. Maybe you're not examining the problem as openly as you thought you were. Right? I know that we don't like that conclusion, but you have to be open to it. That's uh, yeah. true. But, oh, may, go ahead. Go ahead. And the then. one example that was raised of climate change is a very unfortunate counterexample to your point. Perhaps. Because scientists were saying in the 1950s and 60s that climate change increases in CO2 could be a problem. In the 70s, the public was very strongly advocating for environmental protection, preservation. I was taught, you know, don't litter, don't throw it all of those 1970s. Corporate lobbying since then has resulted in much less enshrinement in law relative to what the public wants. That's not a counterexample. That just proves no. Kelly's point. Yeah, but no, but it's That's not all just, it just no, proves his no. point. No, the, pub, the, lo the corporate lobbying is not the public. That's no, a but different set of people, and that's what it brings. Actually, but, corporate yeah. lobbying reflects a certain part. This is, right. You may not like it, yeah. but they reflect that the, the reason they have money mm. is because people give them money mm. because they do something people like. But that's, I mean, we just had an example. I hate to use this example. That's but, not how it happens. We just had a major <laughs> criminal law yeah, uh, reform package passed in schools, largely because of corporate support. So they're part of the system. And you can't say the system doesn't work because there's corporate involvement. It's just, that's not, that's not the way it works. Look, there's a raging debate right now between science and industry, which is just typical. Two years ago, three years ago, Supreme Court says you can't patent a gene. The pharmaceutical industry is spending a huge amount of money to get that decision overruled by Congress. The scientific community is on the other side and is lobbying as hard as it can to convince the members of the members of the right committees that this is a really bad idea. That's the way our system works. And some years we will it will work one way, other years it will work another way. But unless you're prepared to play the game and get involved in it, you're not going to have an impact. You will not get done what you want to get done. Sorry. So several people hinted about this already, but uh, uh, I think we're approaching question six, or at least you know, it seems like most of us are approaching question six uh, as if there was one correct answer to it. And we each believe that we have the correct answer. But I think the reality is that uh, our answer to that question depends on, you know, uh, traced to some deeply held morals and beliefs. And I think this is even more true of society as a whole, like religious people, for example. You know, may have a completely different answer to, to, to this. And at, at the risk of oversimplifying things, I think, Kelly, you may be treating question six as a form of uh, the train dilemma. You know, do you uh, kill one person, uh, trolley, trolley, trolley dilemma, yeah, uh, to, to, save, uh, to save a thousand? And uh, you're saying that it's, it's immoral not to pull the lever to kill uh, the, the one uh, person. And I agree with you, but. Uh, almost every religious person in the world, I think, would disagree with that. So, what I'm trying to make is that I think there is no correct answer to question six, and we should accept that. And I think you, you made the same point, and Judge Tuttle, I think, also made a similar point. So, yeah. so like, how do we, you know, what, what do we do? Um, here, here, I mean, this is a this is a large conversation, right? This is a fundamental problem in ethics. But I would I would say this much. We have to believe that there are better and worse answers in ethics. I'm not saying there are. I'm saying we have to believe there are. <laughs> right? And so I think you know you don't necessarily have to argue that one answer is like the golden answer and everybody who rejects it is an idiot. But you do have to at least maintain that some answers are closer to absolute correctness than others. And you have to be able to give reasons why you think your answers are in that category, not in the bad category. And so you've got to be really careful about sort of saying, well, who's to say? Because then then anybody can step in and say something. I think, hey, wait, something quick. Very quick. Uh, you know, I think maybe the reason why six is so polarizing as written is the word nothing. Yeah. If it said, if there's life on Mars, I believe we should proceed with caution. Yeah. Then maybe cool. almost all of us would agree. But it's the nothing that makes it really polarizing. Yeah, it's, it's Carl's example, but it, I think it's a really interesting one because a lot of people agree with it, and, and that suggests something really interesting about the way you think about the situation. 
So I think that you're not going to, obviously, nobody really cares what this room thinks about this, <laughs> unless there was a way in which you could put it forward as a principle that could be accepted by somebody, right? The, I think that, I mean, obviously the, the people who are proposing, the Mars sample return, thought about this a lot. I mean, it's not like, so uh, do we think that there's a problem with how they're thinking? Do we think that we should say that maybe, I mean, I, I'm most worried, really honestly, about screwing up that we, we like do archaeology in a really poor way and we don't think about how we should have done archaeology in this way. More than you, you're going to have to have a process that will allow all of these people to see that they can achieve what they want to see. You're not going to prevent them from doing anything. You're going to have to, if you want to accomplish something, you're going to have to have a process is going to allow them to be cautious yet accomplish their goals. And, I mean, and that is what was set up in the Punisher Protection Guidelines. And there are a subset of people who decided that that's too inconvenient and too expensive, and therefore we're not going to do those things. We're going to do different things that will so, result. So you can point to the things that, they're, that are not in the planetary guide that you think that they should be pushed back on. Can you clearly enunciate that to Congress? Then? Is that what this is? I could. I am not <laughs> going to do it in public right now. But because. because I spent the last five years doing it, and I'm here right now. <laughs> Let me just say this, that the Mars sample return is, I would say, a microcosm that sort of envelops just about everything that we are talking here. There are those who are fiscally minded. There are those who are scientifically minded, but not in a broad sense. They're scientifically minded for their own particular science. And that particular science doesn't necessarily agree with the, with the person next to them particular science. Then there are the rules and regulations that people are looking at and trying to bend every which way. And actually, I think, trying to do it in a legal fashion so far. Kathy may disagree. I have more things that I can't say Okay, but in any event, it is it, it envelops I, truly a microcosm of all of this. People at there there are groups that are lobbying for everything that you might think of, and just about everything we've we've talked about. It is a very politically complicated situation. It is also a very scientifically and engineering complicated situation. So putting the three of them together. I'm not going to say it makes it an impossible task, but it makes it a very difficult task, much more difficult than it really should be. And with that, uh, that's, that's my opinion and all I think I can say right now about the Mars sample return effort. Yes. Go ahead. So I just want to make sure that the um, just talk about what you should actually expect from philosophers here, speaking as one. Um, if, if you're expecting us to sort of give you the answer, we're not going to do it. Uh, you know, we've been asking some of the same questions for a long, long time. Um, the way you should think about philosophy's con uh, contributions is in providing new concepts, providing novel ways of framing issues. And, you know, some of them are going to be batshit crazy, but some of them are going to be productive. So I, I think we're mostly here to really expand that conceptual space in ways that might not occur to a sort of practicing scientist. So, so don't think of us as answering your questions as much as providing new outlets to try to find answers. Uh, Jenny, okay. We have, we have another question. Penny, oh, Penny. Oh, Penny? Okay, go ahead. Uh, we least, have to, oh, you know, I was held my fire because, <laughs> because I have very opinionated views on all, all of these things. But I, from you know, hearing the, um, the spectrum of opinions on people on the panel, we have a, a, a dire disconnect. In cases, in, in ordinary cases, in how we conduct our lives and how we see new elements in our civilization, when their way through the expert communities, when their way through the uh, public's mind and come to the fore and eventually get translated into law. These are very long, uh, drawn-out processes. There are things that we are contemplating doing and that we have done in the past uh, where there really is a dichotomous situation where you cannot put the genie back in the bottle once you have let it out. And 
when you have a situation where uh, you can't easily go back, uh, you know, many environmental disasters come under that uh, under that umbrella. Then this lovely orderly process that's very democratic about how we, you know, flop around and figure out how to deal with this and have it uh, make its way into the law is uh, great for most things, but if the consequences are dire, then I think uh, that approach is very risky if you cannot take back the consequences without extraordinary problems. And, uh, you know, rabbits in Australia, I mean, I could name a zillion mussels in the Great Lakes. I mean, we've done it in a non-thinking way, and now we have the opportunity to actually do this right. But I am an ethical pessimist, and I don't think we have uh, the moral cojones to actually do it. Okay. And, and uh, there's a lot of money in short-term interest that's advocating for the opposite of course. Absolutely. Uh, we are approaching the witching hour, and there is, would you like to explain? Which, I mean, sure. I can read it, but I don't think everybody right. else can. I don't know if everybody can read it. It seems no. to me, okay, I'll read it then. It seems to me like a lot of the discussion is coming down to where you fall on this spectrum. On the left-hand side is the statement, all life has the same intrinsic value as human life. And the right-hand side says, no life has the same intrinsic value as human life. And then, as Jim was saying, there are shades in between. Like, there's pain and suffering lies somewhere, Earth microbes lie somewhere, Mars microbes lie somewhere. And this is what Russ was saying, how we approach this and where we fall on this line it comes down to our own internal beliefs and moral system. And we're not all going to have the same answer because it is just like what you believe. But I really think it can just, if I oversimplify, I probably am, but I think it's just where we find ourselves on this line. Okay, one, two last questions because it's 8.30. Yes. Well, actually, I'm not sure there is such a thing as intrinsic value. I've become convinced of that very <laughs> That's an excuse for us, you know, that it's our feeling. So I don't think everything actually does fall. Right, so intrinsic value is probably just your moral system, like your beliefs, if you believe it has intrinsic value. Because it makes you feel better. Yeah, but makes so you it's back to you. Catherine, do you want to have the last word? <laughs> In Hell no. <laughs> Thank you, Rocco. I kind of had my hand up for a lot of time, so that's why um, Rock is being kind of. Um, I just wanted to, um, you know, so from the perspective of a social scientist who spent a lot of her career studying complex multi stakeholder problems involving scientists and involving people with very different interests. These are difficult problems. They are wicked problems in the sense that once you solve one part, it keeps on moving, and you don't solve it once, you solve it every day for the rest of your life. So buckle up. And I wanted to say, um, if you think there is anything on Mars, or for that matter, anywhere in the solar system that you want to protect, you have to stop talking about theoretical questions of you know, different kinds of value. These are important discussions, but they are not going to get you anywhere. What's going to get you somewhere is working with the international community, speaking as a Canadian, and mobilizing now for reasonable targets. So for example, planetary parks on Mars, it's a really good idea. Make it happen. Start now. because. Honestly, things are moving so quickly because of your country. <laughs> and like, I, I can't overstate the urgency of this. Similarly, if you're concerned about the, the, water, the ice worlds and, and the outer solar system, start now. OK, it is now 8.30. I'm going to make a shameless plug for the International Journal of Astrobiology. <laughs> and if anybody has anything, in the, for example, in this type of uh, argument that they wish to say that's logical, and then just approach me or anything else. With that, I think we can continue the discussion for those of you who want to in the drink lounge for drinks. Thank you very much.